Hi, everyone. Um, we're very excited to be here with you today uh, to tell you everything you need to know about federated learning. Thinking about what uh, sorting means uh, with respect to the properties of the output of that function, right? Hi, everyone. Um, we're very excited to be here with you today uh, to tell you everything you need to know about federated learning. But this raises some really fundamental questions. If the data isn't being centralized, if it's not going to the data center, how do we still uh, Um, do analytics to understand what's happening and how do we do machine learning to actually build those models in the first place? And so that was really what motivated us to start developing federated learning, uh, particularly federated learning across devices. Uh, 
uh, which we're going to focus on today, but we'll spend some time talking about how kind of the applicability of federated learning has really broadened in the past few years. So we're really talking here about a setting where that raw machine learning training data can stay on devices, but you can still have an ML engineer, a machine learning engineer uh, at a service provider doing productive machine learning workflows with that data, training models, evaluating models, and so on. And since we first started developing this, we've deployed this um, in production in multiple applications across Google and other companies are increasingly doing this as well. Um, so it's useful to briefly touch on kind of what makes a, a, an ideal application for cross-device federated learning. Um, I think most of these come pretty naturally from what I've already said. The first is that that data you have access to on device is more relevant than data you already have uh, on the server. If you already have exactly the training data as much as you want, server side, training on it there will probably be easier. The second is that there's a good reason to leave that data on device. So either it's extremely large in volume or often also that data is privacy sensitive. And so it's prefer preferable not to have to centralize it um, in, in a data center. And then the final thing that's uh, a current limitation to some extent, but new research is continually pushing on, the simplest thing, kind of problem to solve uh, is, is going to be a supervised learning problem where the labels can be inferred naturally from a user's interaction with the device. So again, next word prediction on a mobile keyboard is really nice here. Even if the keyboard doesn't correctly predict the next word you're going to type, you then just kind of type it out manually, and then that can become a feedback signal for the model. So this is, in fact, one of the, the many applications at Google that we're now powering with federated learning. Um, we launched this in the Gboard uh, keyboard um, a while ago now. Um, and it, it was a really nice improvement, actually, on, on the uh, accuracy of the previous models we'd been training in the data center. And the reason for that is we were able to train on actual user interaction data uh, because the way people use mobile keyboards just isn't well reflected in the kind of proxy language data sets that you, you have in the data center. And since then, we've gone on to use federated learning and a bunch more applications just in, in Gboard, um, but also in setting search on Pixel phones, um, in Android messages, and a number of other applications. So this is really now becoming a core part of Google's machine learning privacy story. Uh, but it's definitely going beyond Google as well. Um, I'll just put up one headline here from an article from the MIT um, Technology Review about how Apple is now uh, powering Siri using federated learning technology as well. Uh, so this is, this is becoming a widely used technique. So with that, um, with, with kind of the growth and interest of the field, a bunch of researchers from Google and from uh, many different academic institutions got together last year and wrote this paper on advances in open problems in federated learning. And one of the things we wanted to do was come up with a definition that was broad enough to encompass the range of different applications that people are now finding for federated learning, um, but also um, narrow enough to be useful. And this is what we came up with. Federated learning is a machine learning setting where multiple entities, clients, collaborate in solving a machine learning problem under the coordination of a central server or service provider. Each client's raw data is stored locally and not exchanged or transferred. Instead, focused updates intended for immediate aggregation are used to achieve the learning objective. Uh, so, so let's unpack those two defining characteristics a little bit. Um, the first one is that that data is generated locally and remains decentralized. So each client here stores its own data um, and cannot read the data of other clients. And really importantly, that data is typically not going to be independently or identically distributed. Different clients will have different amounts of data and so on, which introduces a bunch of challenges we'll talk more about. And then something that's also important is we usually imagine that there's a central orchestration server here um, 
that, that is coordinating the training. So that's what the machine learning engineer who's actually training this model and then evaluating it to decide whether to deploy it in production, that's what they are going to primarily interact with. So with that definition, we can now talk about another cross-silo, feder uh, another federated learning setting that's been getting a lot of attention lately, what we're calling the cross-silo setting. So here the clients aren't mobile devices or IoT devices, but potentially large institutions that each want to kind of maintain ownership and control of their own data. So this could be different hospitals or hospital systems. It could be also data from some app or service that has to be, um, where the data has to remain stored in a particular geolocation. Um, so it can't all be, be centralized in one data center. And this has generated a bunch of interest. I think the medical applications in particular here are, are quite clear and quite important. Uh, so I'll again, just kind of um, show, show a few screen grabs here from some of the announcements that Intel, Intel has made um, with partners at UPenn and elsewhere on using federated learning for brain tumor detection. NVIDIA has also invested heavily in this space, uh, again, uh, with a focus on um, healthcare applications, but with other applications in mind as well. So increasingly, we're, we're seeing interest in cross-silo federated learning. And, and because of the, the interest in these two, both of these settings, I think it's, it's worth spending a few minutes kind of contrasting them a little bit. Um, they obviously share those core defining characteristics that we just talked about, um, but there's some important differences that uh, play a big role in determining which kinds of algorithms are most applicable and which, which kind of open problems come up in the different settings. The first difference is, is kind of naturally in the number of clients. In the cross-device setting, we're typically thinking about populations of millions of, of devices, maybe even billions of mobile devices, and each of those devices is only intermittently available. It probably has to satisfy some strict eligibility criteria in order to decide to, to check into the coordinating server and possibly participate in training. In contrast, in the cross-silo setting, we typically have a much smaller number of clients, you know, tens, maybe hundreds of institutions or data silos, and those tend to be because they tend to be hosted in data centers, high availability and capable of participating in training in every cloud. So a consequence of this is then the, in the cross device federated learning setting, we really wanna think more about a distribution of clients. These aren't a, a kind of a, a, a enumerable set where we can index and access particular clients on a particular round whenever we want. Um, the, the selection is typically coarse grained and the updates are anonymous. Whereas in the cross-silo cross federated setting, it's reasonable to assume that each client has an identity or a name that allows you know, the algorithm to potentially refer to that client specifically. Uh, another consequence of this is that in the cross-device setting, the server can really only access a random and possibly biased sample of the, of the total client population on each round. Uh, and when you have a large population, this is typical, most clients are probably only gonna participate in a single round, a single iteration of the training process. Um, again, contrasting the cross-silo setting, there there's few clients that are highly available, so they can and you probably want them to participate in every round. That means in the cross-silo setting, uh, it's quite natural and potentially important to consider stateful algorithms, where an algorithm kind of keeps local state on each client that influences its, its behavior on subsequent rounds. But in the cross-device setting, where you're seeing entirely different sets of clients on each round, that doesn't really make sense because if a client keeps state, you're never going to see that client again. You'll never be able to use it. So this comes up in, in optimization and a number of other areas as an important difference. In the cross-device setting, communication is often the primary bottleneck. Um, in the cross-silo setting, it's, it's less clear depending on the domain. It could be communication or computation. In the cross-device setting, features are almost always kind of, um, or, or the, the, the training data is almost always what we might call horizontally partitioned, where one user's device or one client has one user's device. So there's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping between clients and users uh, as the coloring of the rows and the feature matrix on the left shows. In the cross-silo setting, if you imagine two different um, service providers collaborating to train a model, they might have an overlapping user base. So the, 
different institutions might have different features about potentially overlapping sets of users. That brings up a bunch of additional kind of privacy challenges, um, the need to kind of do joins of various kinds um, to, to join across uh, data for the same user um, that's spread across multiple institutions. We're not gonna talk about that in, in, in much more detail today, but it's, a, it's an important um, aspect of, of some cross-silo applications. And then briefly, I just wanted to contrast this setting with the distributed kind of typical distributed data center machine learning setting. Um, the big difference here is in the data. There you typically have a, a single cloud data set that you can shuffle and distribute in an IID fashion across the worker machines however you want. Um, whereas in the federated setting, you really have to stick with this kind of organically uh, arising non-IID and unbalanced partitioning. So, so, you know, these settings, want, being able to talk about both of these settings with a common terminology motivates the choice of the word client to refer to the, um, the nodes that hold these local private data sets. And the server really just means additional compute nodes that coordinate the whole FL process but don't access the raw data directly. So that's the um, terminology we're gonna try to use today. But for example, in the cross device setting, it's natural to talk about the clients as being devices or even users. I'll just put up a, a couple of slides here for reference that summarize the um, characteristics that I've been talking about. These are discussed in more depth in the uh, Advances in Open Problems and Federated Learning paper. And then a final setting that, that we really need to talk about is what is often called the fully decentralized or peer-to-peer -peer learning setting. So here you don't have the kind of hub and spoke topology that's typical of federated learning. Um, devices connect to other nearby devices in, in a kind of ad hoc um, fashion. Um, this can model a bunch of really interesting scenarios, but it's distinct from federated learning in a couple of ways. Um, one, this isn't being used in practice nearly as much, partly because it's not quite clear how the model engineer or the service provider actually interacts with this kind of ad hoc network. Um, another issue is that for most mobile devices, point to point or peer to peer communication isn't really supported. All of the communication ends up being server mediated anyway. Um, but there are um, substantial uh, overlaps between uh, these, these two uh, areas. Um, and I think there's a lot of common interest. So I think a lot of ideas can be applied to both settings and a lot of what we're saying, at least some of what we're saying, applies to the decentralized setting as well. So for, for the next um, little bit here, I wanna just focus on the cross device setting a little bit more and walk through kind of what the workflow and what a typical protocol might, might look like. But before we get into the federated part, it's worth kind of just having in the back of our minds how machine learning works in, in practice uh, in the standard kind of data center settings, right? So you have a model engineer, they have access to a large cloud data set. Typically they would train and evaluate a bunch of different models, different hyperparameter settings, different architectures on that data, evaluate them carefully, and then go through some final model validation step before deploying a, a single chosen model to mobile devices for, for inference. Um, so we're, we're imagining that we're in the on-device deployment regime here, but the model is still being trained in a centralized fashion. Uh, and one important thing to note is these last kind of validation and deployment steps are pretty much gonna be identical for federated learning. That is, um, the, the, the model engineer is still gonna validate the model trained with federated learning and make the decision about when and how to push it out to production devices in, in exactly the same way. What's different is the training um, because the data isn't stored in the data center, it's on mobile devices. So you have to kind of interact with that coordinating in server to schedule training tasks across mobile devices, schedule evaluation tasks about those devices. Then you get metrics back on how well the models are performing. You keep training until a good model has converged, you validate it and you push it out to production. So now we can zoom in on the training aspect specifically. Um, devices typically in the cross device setting decide when they wanna check in to the server and whether or not they wanna participate 
And they'll only do that when they meet eligibility criteria, like being plugged in on a free Wi-Fi network, et cetera. Um, so they'll check in. And if there's a lot of devices, most of the time the, the server will just say, we don't need you now. But some fraction of devices will be selected to run um, federated training tasks. There, the model engineer will usually start with some initial model, say randomly initialized. And in the broadcast phase, that model is shipped to or transmitted to the, the devices that are participating in this particular training round. Then on device, they run TensorFlow or another on device computation platform um, to look at the local mo the, the model that's been sent from the server and the local data and compute, compute an ephemeral uh, updated model that's sent back to the server. And that model's ephemeral in two senses. It's not persisted on the device, it's just kind of an intermediate artifact of the training process. And it's also not persisted on um, the server any longer than is necessary to kind of aggregate to combine it with other devices. But this brings us to, to one of the first privacy principles that really motivates um, the design of this uh, federated learning interaction. And that is that the only thing we're sending from the device to the server is kind of a minimal update um, intended for this particular computation, right? We're not sending the raw data, we're sending something like an update or a gradient that's specific to improving this particular model. And as I was saying, um, those updates are ephemeral and they're aggregated as soon as possible. And in particular, the model engineer is never going to get access to any individual user updates. They'll only see the aggregate metrics or the result of the model after an aggregate uh, update has been applied. So this iterates um, for, for multiple rounds or iterations until uh, you've trained a high mo quality model to convergence. So just to give you a sense of the, the typical orders of magnitude here, we might have 100 to a few thousand devices um, contributing, contributing updates on each round, then maybe thousands of rounds to convergence and uh, some small number of minutes for each of those rounds. So in, this, in practice, this means you can train a production quality deep neural network in one day to up to a week for a really big complex model that you wanted to, to get the last bit of quality out of. What I haven't said anything about are the particular optimization algorithms that we can plug into this framework. We're gonna dive into that in depth in the next part of this tutorial. Uh, but before we do that, I'm gonna hand it over to Peter to talk a little bit about the analytics side of uh, Federated. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Brendan. Uh, so we've seen how Federated Learning can help us train high quality models, but it can actually go well beyond learning and in fact, we can look at a variety of analytics tasks that are very important in practice. For instance, we might be interested in computing location heat maps or infection spread uh, over locations. Or for instance, we might want to discover frequently typed words that are out of dictionaries. For instance, in this use case, COVID-19 is a new frequently typed word on many people's keyboard, and it would be nice to discover such new trends. Or for instance, we can try to compute and find and discover uh, new activities and trends, uh, things like what are the popular songs these days or emerging trends and activities. So all this can be done using federated analytics. So here's a newly uh, uh, def a new definition in um, one of our blogs. Federated analytics is the practice of applying data science methods to the analysis of raw data that is stored locally on users' devices. So like federated learning, it works by running local computations over each device's data and only making the aggregated results and never the data from a particular device available to the product end user. But unlike federated learning, federated analytics aims to support basic data science needs. So here are some basic data science and statistics that we may want to compute using federated analytics. One thing you can think of is histograms multivariate histograms, sparse, sparse histograms over closed sets or even uh, over open sets. We can think of computing quantiles, percentiles, uh, distinct element counts, discover new items, popular words, heavy uh, elements and open sets or density of vector spaces. All these are applications of federated analytics. In fact, you should potentially, you know, at one point start thinking of uh, 
a large fraction of SQL operations as federated analytics, or and you can even broaden it to perhaps any type of a large scale computation on devices. Now, it's important to distinguish between two types of federated analytics algorithms. The first is interactive. This is very similar to uh, the algorithms that Brendan discussed for learning. Here, there is a server state, and this server state is updated in every round. And based on the updated state, clients would compute something on the data that they have. For instance, one application in the heavy hitters domain discovers popular words by learning popular prefixes of these words. So in every round, the server would broadcast the popular prefixes that it has discovered, and then devices can vote on extensions to those prefixes. And you can see how this is a very interactive algorithm that mimics what we do in learning at a high level. Now, at the same time, there are simpler type algorithms. Those are non-interactive algorithms where there is no need to track and maintain a server state and then broadcast it in each round to the client so that they know what to compute as a function of the state. Here, for instance, we can think of simple sketching or bloom filtering techniques so that the users can compute this minimal focused update on their data and just send it back to the server where it's aggregated. One use case and application is Rapport, which is a technology for computing statistics, histograms, and even discovering heavy hitters using bloom filters and differential typing. We're going to see a little bit more about these later in this tutorial. All right, so this concludes the first part of the tutorial, the intro to federated learning and analytics. We still have three parts. In part two, we're going to focus on optimization and all the flavors of optimization that are important. In part three, we're going to talk about privacy and the technologies that can be used uh, in addition to federated learning. And then the last part is going to tackle uh, open problems and other topics. So in part one of the tutorial, we covered some general characteristics of federated learning and analytics. In the second part, we're going to be doing a deep dive into optimization techniques for federated learning. And we'll be focusing specifically on the problem of supervised learning in a cross-device setting, although many of the, the general techniques and challenges that we'll be talking about um, could be applicable to, to other settings as well. So first, let me kind of reiterate uh, the way that federated learning really differs from kind of some prior work in, in distributed learning, and in particular, in thinking about solving machine learning problems in the, the data center setting. So the broad goal in federated optimization is to train machine learning models at the edge. If you think about kind of how this might be done in a cloud-based training scenario, uh, sort of the baseline here is that you can imagine generating data on a set of devices, but then sending all of that raw data to the cloud and performing training there, potentially in, in a distributed manner. Uh, on the other extreme, in the federated setting, the goal is to really push as much uh, to the edge as we can. Um, so instead of kind of having the, the model and the data all stored uh, in the cloud, here we're storing the models and the raw data on each of the devices in the network. And then rather than sending raw data across uh, you know, the, the network from the devices to the cloud, we're sending downstream model updates and uh, the final model between the, the, the central server and the devices. And again, there are a lot of you know, reasons why this, this might be beneficial. So uh, this can help to reduce communication. It can reduce strain on the network. Uh, as we'll see, there are also privacy benefits for doing this. Uh, and it also allows you to potentially more quickly incorporate new data that you're seeing on these devices. Okay, so in terms of thinking about the sort of workflow for, for training and for federated optimization, this uh, kind of high level um, setup on the left is, is what we'll be thinking about uh, in this section. Uh, so in terms of the objective that we're solving, um, this might be a kind of traditional empirical risk minimization objective. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in just a second, but you can think about this as being uh, kind of a sum of, of losses across uh, your M different devices. And then when we're thinking about training this objective, 
the, the training setup is sort of as follows. So we have a, a server that's coordinating all of the updates between our devices. And at each iteration, that server uh, sends the current model to a subset of the, the devices. Those devices then perform some local training and send their model updates back to the central server. So the setup I've just described sounds a lot like prior work in distributed learning, but there are a few challenges and we've already touched on these kind of in the intro, but I'll reiterate them here. And, and in particular, we'll be focusing on how they affect uh, optimization in particular. So one way that this setting differs potentially from traditional distributed data center computing is that while in distributed settings, communication is really a known bottleneck, um, here, communication can potentially be much more expensive than in traditional data center settings. Uh, so in addition to the network itself potentially being slower, it also might be more massive. Uh, so whereas in the data center, you might have you know, hundreds to thousands of machines, here you could have thousands to millions of devices. Additionally, as, as we've discussed, there are potentially significant privacy concerns with sending data over the network. So in comparison to you know, a data center setting where you might be able to assume that you have kind of private and secure access to all of the data in the data center here, because the data is, is living uh, on the devices and it's being generated on these devices, uh, we'd like to keep that data local to those devices if, if possible and to ensure that the data that we are sending from those devices uh, has some, uh, some privacy guarantees. Finally, one way that this setting really differs from traditional data center computing is that in the data center, you may imagine that you're able to sort of own and, and take all of the data and partition it at will. Uh, in comparison, in the federated setting, because the data is being generated on these devices, the data that's on these devices might look very different from one device to another. So you can get data that's uh, very unbalanced across the network and is very non-identically distributed. So there can be a tremendous amount of statistical heterogeneity in the network. And this heterogeneity can come not only from, from the data, but also from the system side as well. So there can potentially be variability in the, the hardware or the connectivity of these devices. And this can also play an important role in how we think about optimization methods and uh, analyses in this setting. All right, so let's take a little bit of a, a closer look at this objective and the training setup and sort of the assumptions that we're making here. So first, let me start with this objective. So as I mentioned, typically we're considering solving some empirical risk minimization objective. So this would possibly be you know, a weighted average of losses across the M devices in the network. Uh, and we're thinking about these losses you know, accessing the, the local data on device K, for example. Uh, and this is the, the, the sort of objective that we'll be looking at in, in this part of the tutorial, but I wanted to note that many of the challenges that we'll be discussing can translate to other common machine learning objectives as well. All right, so let me uh, take a, a quick aside and, and kind of motivate where we're getting the objective that I, that I showed in the previous slide. So first I wanted to note just as uh, kind of a background in, in ML, uh, if you think about uh, these empirical risk minimization objectives in sort of the traditional sense, if you imagine that you just have a, a sample of, of n data points, um, if we think about the empirical risk objective, this is coming from, uh, you know, trying to estimate uh, the true underlying risk, where we have some uh, underlying population of data, and we're trying to find some predictor, h of x and w, that takes our data and produces uh, some prediction uh, that hopefully is a good fit to our labels Y. Okay, and, and that uh, measure of performance is, is measured via the, this loss function. Okay, and in empirical risk, the idea is that we have some access to a sample of data, so n data points, and the goal is to use this empirical risk minimization objective to uh, deliver a, an estimate of this true underlying risk. Now, there's a slight distinction here that it is important to make in, in terms of thinking about uh, the notion of risk and empirical risk in the federated setting. Uh, and if we, if we think about kind of the, the true underlying risk in, in the federated setting, there's another sort of Im important distribution to introduce here, which is the distribution of devices across the network. Uh, so as was mentioned in, the, in part one, uh, 
uh, we might have only you know, a small sample of the total possible population of devices uh, that we're seeing. And additionally, on each of those devices, the devices can be generating data according to their own distribution, P sub K. Okay, so if we're thinking about how to kind of solve this in the traditional empirical risk minimization setup, uh, we again, you know, we assume that we have some sample of data, but now that this data is being, uh, now this data is being generated from M different devices in the network, and each of the, the devices may be generating data according to its own distribution P sub K. Right, so the, the corresponding empirical risk uh, objective to, to this underlying true risk would look like this. So basically what we're doing here is we're summing over the M different devices, on a, and on each of those devices, uh, we're, we're using our local data to estimate the, the true underlying risk according to our, uh, our distribution P sub K. Okay. I, I also wanted to, to show this slide just as, you know, to make sure uh, we have a good pointer here in terms of all of this, this terminology because I realize this objective might look a little bit dense. Uh, so just to, to put this up here, we'll try to keep this consistent through the rest of the slides. So M is the total number of devices in the network. Uh, and again, we're thinking here in, in this part uh, of the, particularly of the cross device setting. N is the total number of data points. N sub K is the number of data points on device K. X sub K and Y sub K, these would be uh, the ice data point on device K, and again, we're thinking in, in this particular instance in, in solving a, a supervised learning problem, so we have access to these labels, Y sub K. And W, these are the model parameters, so these are the parameters of, of the, the model that we're trying to fit to our data. Okay, and I wanted to note, uh, again, kind of re referencing the, the earlier slide that we can think about this full sort of empirical risk minimization objective, um, just to, to simplify the notation in the remainder of the slides, uh, what, you'll, what you'll see is that I, I will be simplifying this as just a sum over the M devices uh, where we're weighting the local objectives. So these local objectives, F sub K of W, you can think about these as being basically just empirical risk minimization objectives, um, but on specifically the local data uh, corresponding to a device K. Okay. All right, so uh, again, this is kind of just giving a, an overview of the objective that we're solving. There's one other thing I wanted to note here in terms of the workflow, um, and that's just uh, to remind you that here, you know, we're considering specifically the, the cross-device setting of, of federated learning, and we're assuming that we have a centralized server. Um, we've already talked a little bit about other assumptions that you might make in the general problem of federated learning, and we'll discuss those a little bit more in part four. Okay, so let's take a closer look also at these, these challenges and let's talk specifically about how we can think about uh, addressing these challenges with our optimization methods. So the first challenge I mentioned is that uh, communication can be extremely expensive in uh, the cross device setting of, of federated learning. And there are a few common strategies to think about to reduce the cost of communication. So one very simple strategy that, that comes to mind and is not necessarily so much as a strategy as sometimes a constraint, is that when you have a very, very large network, say of millions of devices, it might be impractical um, to imagine that you're able to actually communicate with all of those devices at each iteration. So sort of one very um, clear strategy to reduce communication is to limit the number of devices that are actually involved in any one communication round. Another general, strat general strategy to reduce communication is to reduce the total number of communication rounds of your optimization procedure. And then finally, we'll, we'll also talk about the uh, general strategy of kind of re just reducing the size of messages that are sent over the network. Um, so reducing the, um, you know, the size of whatever you're sending from the device to the server or the server to the devices. <clears throat> okay, I also, I also mentioned uh, that privacy is an important concern in this setting. Uh, so one kind of first step in, in this direction of ensuring privacy is that one of the assumptions in federated learning is that we're keeping the, the raw data that's generated by these devices local to the devices themselves. So we're not, for example, taking all of that raw data and sending it to the cloud. So this is sort of a, a first step, and this is what makes this, you know, a, a large distributed optimization problem. Um, but we'll also talk in, in part three about various privacy mechanisms that you can add on top of the optimization procedures that we'll be discussing. And finally, I, I mentioned the, the challenge of heterogeneity. 
so again, this heterogeneity can show up both in terms of the data that's being generated on these devices and also in terms of the underlying systems that are being used as part of this training procedure, so the, the devices themselves. Um, and this heterogeneity is very important to consider in terms of the optimization process, uh, because this, as we'll see in just a moment, can potentially produce uh, some biased optimization procedures. Okay, so I also wanted to, to briefly mention while we're here, uh, so we have a, a recent uh, white paper in, uh, that looks a little bit more at some of these, these challenges. Um, so if you're interested in, in thinking more about these specific challenges and how they relate to uh, federated optimization, I would encourage you to, to take a look at this white paper. Um, but for the remainder of the tutorial now, I'd like to, to focus, uh, shift our focus to talking about some specific techniques for federated optimization. So the first technique I'd, I'd like to discuss is uh, a very popular and standard baseline for federated learning, known as federated averaging. So in federated averaging, the way that we can think about this, this uh, distributed optimization procedure is again, we assume that we have this network of uh, a server and some number of devices, so M devices. And the goal is to solve the, you know, this optimization objective that we discussed in an iterative fashion. So what can happen at each you know, iteration or communication round is that the, the server will send its current notion of the model to a subset of the devices. Those devices will then perform some local training. So for example, in federated averaging, this may be you know, running E epics of mini batch stochastic gradient descent locally. Then after these devices have performed this local training, they can send their model updates back to the central server, uh, where in the case of federated averaging, these model updates are averaged to produce the next model iterate. Okay, so let me just uh, kind of repeat what I said, but, but here uh, in words. So what happens in this iterative optimization procedure is that at each communication round, uh, the central server will send out the current notion of the model to a subset of the, the devices. The devices will then run some local solver like Minibatch SGD locally. Then those devices will send their model updates back to the server where they will be averaged. Uh, you can potentially consider adding privacy mechanisms on top of this, on top of these communications. So we'll be discussing uh, that more in part three. But the key thing to think about in, in terms of, you know, thinking about how this, this baseline and, and this procedure is useful for the federated setting is that the techniques used here can be very useful to reduce communication. Uh, and in particular, the, the two things that you're seeing here are that one, um, each of these devices uh, is running some local training procedure. And so we'll explain in just a moment how that can really reduce the, the total number of communication rounds that are necessary. Uh, but two, you see that also the, the server is only communicating with a, a subset of the devices. So these are two general strategies to help reduce the, the communication bottleneck in this setting. Okay, so uh, I think this is a really important question. What I've just described, if you think about this at a high level, might sound a lot like, say, uh, distributed mini-batch stochastic gradient descent. But there are a couple really important distinctions between federated averaging and mini-batch stochastic gradient descent. So I wanted to, to kind of point those out in a really simplified way. Uh, so what you see here on the left is the, the kind of basic computation on a single device K. Uh, if you were to be running distributed mini-batch SGD, uh, say in this you know, federated network. What you would do on a single device at each communication round is that you would have some set of points, so um, some set of points I in your mini batch B, and what you would do on, on that one device is you would compute all of the gradients uh, as part of that mini batch, and then importantly, you wouldn't actually apply those gradient updates to the model until you send all of those gradient updates back to the central server. So sort of until you break this for loop that you're seeing. In contrast, if you think about what federated averaging is doing, a key distinction is that rather than just kind of computing all of these gradients and then sending that gradient information back to the server, what federated averaging is doing is it's actually running a local optimization method on each of the devices. 
So if we think about the, the computation and the training procedure on a single device K, what it's doing is it's running some number of iterations of a local solver. So just to make this kind of an apples to apples comparison, here what I'm considering is that we're running some number of iterations, say of stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and so what's happening in each of these iterations is that we're not only computing the stochastic gradient, but we're also applying that gradient to the model. Okay, and this is, uh, this is a really important distinction for two reasons. So one, you know, if you look at kind of the, the first part of the pseudocode, uh, on the left, you see that sort of the max amount of computation that you can do in this for loop would be one pass through your, your mini batch B. In contrast, if you look at the right, what you can see is that you can run this for potentially a very large number of local iterations. And the reason that there's you know, really a distinction here is because of this change in where the, the updates are, are happening to the model. So uh, on the case on the left, if you're thinking about kind of just mini batch stochastic gradient descent distributed across this network, you don't actually apply the updates until you send those gradients back to the central server. Instead, in federated averaging, because you're running some local solver, you are computing a stochastic gradient and then you're immediately applying it to, to the local model. Okay, <clears throat> and so just to kind of reiterate that, uh, you know, why is it so useful to perform, you know, local updating the way that is done in federated averaging? You know, one distinction is just that by doing this, you can perform much more local computation than just a traditional sort of uh, mini batch method. Um, but the other thing that can be very beneficial in terms of reducing the total communication cost is that you're incorporating the updates that you do calculate more quickly than if you had to wait to actually communicate them back to the server. So you compute gradient information and then you immediately apply that gradient information. Okay, so this can really lead to this federated averaging method converging in many fewer communication rounds than something like mini batch stochastic gradient descent. Okay, and so just to see that, I've, I've grabbed this table. This is from uh, the paper that you know, introduced federated averaging. And what you can see is that if you compare uh, federated SGD, so this is just a variant basically of, of mini batch SGD that uses this federated principle of, of you know, selecting a subset of the clients at each iteration. Uh, so if you compare that to in green here, federated averaging, um, and specifically, this is you know, an instance of federated averaging where you're doing a large amount of, of local computation. Uh, what you can see is that this number here, both in the IID column and the non-IID column, this corresponds to the speed up that federated averaging has to reach the same test accuracy as uh, the federated SGD method. And so you can see in this first example on this first data set uh, that you're able to get up to you know 35 x uh, speed up relative to just this uh, distributed mini batch SGD method and if you look down here uh, this is another data set this is a Shakespeare data set uh, what you can see is that uh, the improvement here is even larger so we're getting almost a, a 100 x speed up over just the kind of naive distributed stochastic gradient descent method Okay, and so the kind of key takeaway from these results is that this idea of local updating uh, is really important in the federated setting. When communication is a known bottleneck, uh, this can be, really be an effective way to reduce the total number of communication rounds, right? So in this example, we're able to reduce communication rounds by you know, roughly 100x relative to the, the baseline of distributed mini batch stochastic gradient descent. Okay, and I wanted to kind of make a quick aside here to note that I think that uh, federated learning is a really compelling use case for the idea of local updating. Uh, but I wanted to note, obviously, that this idea of local updating has been used in various forms in other optimization procedures previously, right? So one kind of natural uh, method to consider as kind of an extreme of federated averaging would be if you did only a single communication round uh, and you completely solved the local objectives, this would be you know, analogous to a one-shot averaging approach, which has been proposed and analyzed you know, previously in, in the distributed optimization literature. There are also you know, related methods in consensus-based optimization, where you, know, you can think about things like ADMM or more recently this uh, method called COCO, which stands for Communication Efficient uh, Coordinate Ascent. Uh, 
And these methods use the dual to effectively take the, the objective of interest and split it into more easily separable subproblems and then sol solve those subproblems to, to some accuracy by doing local updating. Uh, so this is just an example from uh, this, this work, COCO in particular, you can see that, that here, this idea of local updating is also very useful relative to, to these baselines of, of kind of, you know, traditional mini-batch variants of, uh, of these stochastic procedures. Okay, but one issue with kind of the, the, the prior work here in consensus-based optimization Is that you're typically thinking about splitting this problem into subproblems by using duality, and so you know if we're thinking about uh, the problem of federated learning, we're often thinking about solving you know non-convex deep learning objectives, and so in, for those cases, it can be really important to think about how we can uh, level, leverage methods that work on the primal. Okay, and so I wanted to note uh, that in that setting, there there has also been some work in thinking about kind of uh, a variant of, of federated averaging, uh, which is known as local SGD, uh, which is very similar in nature. So you basically run SGD locally, and then you can think about averaging those solutions. Um, but there's a, an important distinction I want to make here about kind of what federated averaging is doing and, and kind of the setting of federated learning more generally. Uh, so one thing that really distinguishes this setting from this, you know, the, the previous line of work that considers local updating is that uh, in the federated setting, we're thinking about local updating to reduce communication, but we have a lot of other constraints to satisfy simultaneously. Uh, so we're dealing with this non-identically distributed heterogeneous data. We're also dealing with partial device participation. And again, we're often thinking about trying to solve a non-convex objective, like a deep neural network. And so if you think about these constraints in unison, this really makes this, this setting uh, quite distinct from, from this prior work. Okay, uh, so I wanted to note a couple more things about this uh, local updating procedure. Uh, so as I mentioned, local updating can be extremely useful to speed up the overall kind of convergence of the method and particularly to reduce the number of communication rounds. But one thing to be careful about and one thing to be aware of is that this local updating procedure, if it's not tuned properly, can potentially hurt your convergence. So kind of what exactly do I mean by that? Well, if we go back to the, the previous example um, that I showed of, of kind of the performance improvement that you see when using federated averaging on this Shakespeare data set, if you take this to its extreme, so if you increase the number of local epics that you're using for, uh, for training uh, your local optimization procedure, uh, what you see is that as you start to do a large amount of local work, you can get this degradation in the convergence behavior. So you can see that as we're increasing the number of local epics, as we're doing more local work as part of this local updating procedure, uh, we can start to have some, some issues with convergence. And this is happening not only in terms of, you know, thinking about the total number of rounds here on the x-axis to reduce our training loss, but also if we look at the, the kind of final test accuracy. So we can see that, you know, if we're not careful, if we're, if we're using these uh, kind of complex heterogeneous uh, federated data sets and we're using this local updating procedure, um, there can potentially be some, some issues with convergence. And, and kind of what's going on here? Um, so what you see is that if you, if you keep all of kind of the hyperparameters of this method fixed and you just increase the heterogeneity, uh, so that's what we're doing kind of in this experiment here, as we move from left to right, we're making this synthetic data more heterogeneous. 
uh, what you can see is that you know the the issue with convergence is really a, a byproduct of this heterogeneity. Okay, <clears throat> and so uh, you know this is something that's important to remember as well when you uh, also have additional sources of heterogeneity in the federated setting, right? So as I mentioned, we have heterogeneity not only coming from the data but also potentially from the devices themselves. Uh, so how can this affect the optimization procedure? Uh, if you have devices that vary in terms of their ability to participate in the, the training procedure at each round, you can have an issue where you might have significant uh, numbers of stragglers in the distributed computation. Okay, and so if we take something you know, that already potentially has uh, you know, some concern in terms of the, just the data heterogeneity, and you additionally add this issue of systems heterogeneity, specifically you, know, you have an issue where you might have a large number of stragglers, uh, this is something that can really exacerbate these convergence issues. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so what's going on here? I think this is, a, this is kind of a very simple um, cartoon of, of sort of what could potentially be going wrong with, with local updating if you're not careful. So on the left, what I'm showing is if we you know, think about our current model iterate W sub T and sort of the optimal model W star, and we're performing a small number of uh, you know, local updates in a setting where we have sort of, you know, roughly IID data. Uh, this is a, a really natural thing to do in that if we think about kind of averaging these solutions, we'll end up getting a good estimate for the kind of correct optimal model. What you're seeing on the right is kind of intuitively if, if these uh, two kind of optimal models, W1 and, and W2, so these would be the the, you know, corresponding to the local subproblems on, on two devices, for example. If we do local updating in a scenario where these differ, one issue is that you can see that if we just kind of, uh, you know, naively average those solutions, we can arrive at something that maybe is not a good estimate of the, the optimal model. Right, and, you know, how can we think about handling this? Well, very intuitively, you know, one way to, you know, make sure that you're performing local updating in a way that's useful in terms of uh, speeding up the, the convergence, but also, you know, doesn't run into these convergence issues is to think about effectively limiting the amount of local updates. So you want to do some small amount of local updating, but you want to ensure that the updates that you, you are doing in this, in this local updating procedure are still well behaved. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm, I'm showing on, on the left here. And I think one kind of very natural way to instantiate this uh, distinction is that you can think about the, the local objective that you're solving on device K. And you can think about either, you know, only running some local solver like SGD for a small number of iterations, or you can alternatively think about just adding, you know, for example, a regularizer to the local subproblem. And what this regularizer here is doing is effectively just ensuring that the, the model that you find at this iteration, this you know, W sub K that you're solving for, doesn't differ too much from the previous model iterate. So essentially what this regularizer is doing is ensuring that you are doing some local updating, but not so much that you could potentially be going you know, kind of awry in these two different directions that can uh, you know, give you issues with your overall convergence behavior. Okay, so this is something that we we looked at in this, this method FedProx, and uh, the reason that I'm bringing up this method in particular uh, is that one thing that's nice about kind of formulating the, the problem in this way is that it also allows us to reason about the, the theoretical uh, performance of this federated averaging style method. Okay, so in particular with this uh, modification to the local subproblems, we can actually show that this, uh, this method FedProx is guaranteed to converge despite several very kind of challenging constraints. So despite the fact that this method is running over non-identically distributed data in the network, despite the fact that we're performing local updating, which is useful again to you know, speed up convergence in terms of the total number of communication rounds, and despite the fact that we may have partial participation from the devices in the network. Okay, and, and how are we actually you know, able to show the convergence guarantees for this method? Uh, I wanted to bring this up um, because uh, this is, you know, there's been a lot of work in, in thinking about, you know, improving upon these uh, convergence guarantees in various ways and, and coming up with more sophisticated methods for federated optimization. But I think uh, the convergence guarantees here 
really describe a lot of the, the key considerations to think about in, in the federated setting. Okay, so what we're doing in FedProx in particular is that uh, in order to guarantee convergence, we have the, the following assumption, which is that we're measuring at a high level how dissimilar the gradients are across the network. Uh, so the idea here with this uh, notion, which we're calling B dissimilarity, is that uh, the more variance, the more uh, dissimilar, dissimilar these gradients are, uh, the larger this value of B will be. Okay, and this will correspond to having uh, more heterogeneous data. <clears throat> okay, and the reason that this is important in terms of the, the kind of final convergence guarantees that we're able to provide is that intuitively what you see is that if you have more heterogeneous data, if this notion of, of B dissimilarity, uh, this parameter B is larger, what you'll see is it will take you more overall uh, rounds to converge because this parameter mu, mu, which corresponds, just going back a slide, to this proximal term will have to be larger, right? So intuitively what this is showing is that if the, you know, if you have more heterogeneous data, you have to limit those local updates to ensure that you're still able to converge to the correct solution. Again, I wanted to note here briefly as well that this notion of B dissimilarity, this has been uh, actually used for, for various purposes in, in previous optimization literature. So one example where this has been used previously is in defining this notion of gradient diversity, uh, which is interesting. It's actually in this setting a, a useful way to uh, Im improve the convergence guarantees of mini batch stochastic gradient descent. But what you see here in the federated setting is that potentially this uh, dissimilarity can actually be uh, something that can slow you down uh, for the reason being that, you know, if you have uh, this uh, dissimilarity, it, it corresponds to having more heterogeneous data, which means you potentially might need to reduce the, the number of local updates that you're performing. Okay, so let me summarize here with a, a few quick takeaways, and then I'm going to talk about uh, one more very common technique that's used to, to think about reducing overall communication. Uh, so in terms of thinking about these federated optimization methods, again, kind of the, the key thing that, that makes these very useful in, in terms of reducing communication is performing this, this local updating on a, a subset of the devices at each round. Um, so this is a, a really powerful tool that can help to significantly reduce the, the number of communication rounds needed for convergence. But it's important to think about how you know, these methods work when we're deploying them over heterogeneous data and heterogeneous systems. And in particular, this, this heterogeneity can potentially lead to slower convergence, reduced stability, or even divergence. And for this reason, it's really critical when you're thinking about federated optimization to think about analyzing and evaluating methods that are compatible with non-identically distributed data and that also consider this issue of partial or variable participation from the, the devices or the clients. Okay, so there's one more thing I wanted to note here in terms of dealing with the issue of expensive communication. So there's one more strategy that we have not talked about yet, uh, which is the idea of reducing the size of the messages sent over the network. So, uh, Intuitively, you know, it's possible to also kind of consider techniques that reduce the, sort of the total volume of communication uh, by reducing uh, the size of, of messages sent, whether they're, you know, reducing the size of the updates that you're sending from the devices to the server, or whether you're reducing the size of the, the model that you're sending from the server to the devices. Okay, and there are two, you know, sets of approaches that are really common to consider. One is thinking about the general technique of, of dimensionality reduction. So you're actually learning a model, for example, or these model updates, and you're, as part of that learning process, you're learning these updates that are of a reduced dimension. Alternatively, you can consider uh, the kind of more general approach of using the sort of traditional procedure, but then compressing the updates or compressing the model, right? So this would be sort of happening after the fact and would be applicable to um, you know, any sort of method that you might be uh, running under the hood. Uh, so the idea here is that you take sort of the regular updates, uh, whether from the device to the server or the server to the devices, and you think about compressing them in some way. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, in terms of compression, there are a few common techniques. 
so one technique that's that's quite common is you know thinking about how to sparsify the the model parameters that you're that you're setting. Um, one, in fact, very natural way to to think about you know sparsifying or reducing the the size of the model is to think about using something like dropout. So dropout is commonly used for deep neural networks as a form of regularization, but it also has this nice compression benefit. Uh, and then another really common technique is, is quantization. Uh, so sending a smaller number of bits over the network. And I have kind of one example um, here that I'll show, which is, is just showing a comparison of uh, kind of sending a, an update. We're looking at the convergence procedure. This is specifically on the, the EMNEST uh, data set. And you can see that uh, if we think about actually quantizing, uh, using quantization, uh, a pretty substantial amount. So looking at just uh, eight bits, four bits, or two bits, um, what you're able to see is that this is this is really able to converge um, with almost the exact uh, performance of, of full precision. And so empirically, at least, we can we can see you know many examples of, of something like quantization really working well in practice and and. Um, effectively uh, compressing the updates that are sent over the network. Uh, there are two kind of other things I wanted to mention along this direction. One is that it's it's really natural, of course, to think about composing this these techniques, right? So you can use all of the the sorts of you know previous uh, communication reduction tools we talked about, reducing the number of clients that you're communicating with, reducing the the total number of communication rounds, and then even within these compression techniques, for example. Uh, you can think about uh, this is kind of a depiction of using dropout on the server, uh, and then uh, additionally maybe performing quantization or uh, compressing that um, smaller model that you're sending then to the clients. Right, so you can think about um, kind of plugging and playing with these these various compression techniques. Okay, of course, kind of the you know just as a word of caution, the important thing to consider here is kind of rigorously understanding how these forms of compression may either bias or potentially increase the variance of your optimization procedures. And so this is something that you know, is potentially very powerful in terms of reducing communication, um, but obviously can affect the underlying optimization procedure. So it's important to think about you know, trading off between the two of those. OK, and, and now I'm going to pass it over to, to Brendan, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, some kind of hands-on tools and best practices for evaluating federated optimization methods. Great, thanks, Virginia. Yeah, so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, kind of how you can get your hands dirty with federated averaging and other federated optimization algorithms. Uh, and the platform we've developed for this at Google is TensorFlow Federated, um, which we, we announced uh, a while ago and has, has um, continued to improve and be actively developed uh, since then. Um, the basic idea with, with uh, TFF is that we provide a declarative API and language for defining uh, federated computations. I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, there's a high performance distributed uh, kind of data center, data center based runtime uh, that's highly scalable and useful for doing FL research, FL simulations. There's a layer of computation libraries uh, on top of that that implement a bunch of standard federated optimization and, and analytics algorithms. And it's also been integrated with other libraries like TensorFlow Privacy for differential privacy. So let's look at um, what it takes to implement something like federated averaging in this framework. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to say here is that, that TensorFlow Federated, we don't provide like an actual mobile runtime uh, to deploy TFF computations uh, on device uh, in open source currently. But TFF was definitely designed with that in mind, and that's a direction that hopefully we'll be able to go in the future. Um, so I'll talk about some of those design constraints now, but also in when we talk a little bit about systems challenges in part four. So the first thing to do to implement an algorithm in, in TensorFlow Federated is to implement kind of the computation, the parts of the computation that run locally on the device and on the server. So we don't need to go into too much detail of this pseudocode, but this is basically a very simple client update that will take um, weight model weights, model parameters provided by the server and a local data set. And then there's basically just a for loop over batches in that local data set where we apply gradients, basically it apply a local update uh, optimizer to compute an update to the global, to the global model. So you express this kind of using pure TensorFlow. There's no TensorFlow federated yet. 
Similarly, you write a really small function, uh, TensorFlow computation, um, that encapsulates the logic that, uh, that, that runs on the server. So here, that just takes the average client update. We don't know how we get the average yet. We'll get to that in a second. But it takes the client, the average client update, scales it by a server learning rate, and adds it into the global model. And the important thing with these um, TensorFlow computations that I've highlighted in the orange boxes, if these are serializable, they can be potentially shipped to devices and run in a production runtime environment without any Python or anything else. They're, they're kind of self-contained. They can be represented as self-contained TensorFlow graphs that can be shipped for execution elsewhere. And then the kind of special sauce of TensorFlow Federated is a declarative strongly typed language. You write it in Python, but it's, it's under the hood. You can really think of it as a, as a domain specific programming language to reason about the overall distributed uh, computation you want to run. So you use declarative operators like a federated broadcast to move data from a server placement to a client placement, a federated map to invoke those local computations we just defined, um, either on the server or on, on clients. And then federated aggregation operators, like a simple federated mean, to collect uh, a set of values distributed across clients and produce the mean on the server. And so here's an example of what kind of that federated orchestration logic looks like. Um, so we start out with having some current model parameters, the server weights, those are placed at the server, that's part of the type signature. And we use a federated broadcast to give us another kind of handle that represents those values that now exist at the client. So that's not, we can't like print out the value of the server weights at the clients. That's, you should think of that as a handle or, or a reference that can be fed into other parts of the computation. In particular, we then use a federated map to execute the client update function on the federated data set, that is the local data set on each client, plus those weights we've broadcast to the clients. We collect those updates with a federated mean, and then we pass that result of that federated mean, which is now placed at the server, into that server update function. And then this gives us a function we can just, we can just iterate. And one thing that's really nice about this, these declarative aggregation and broadcast operators are, are amenable to kind of a large scale multi-tiered uh, distributed implementation. Um, so we, we're, we're free to uh, specify that. Um, now I wanted to, to move on to empirical evaluation of, of federated optimization algorithms here with, with a, a, a particular focus. Um, that is, I think all of us presenting today believe that federated learning really offers the possibility to dramatically improve privacy versus utility trade-offs across a wide range of ML problems. Uh, put more simply, we think federated learning can really make the world a better place. We can benefit from this data, we can get medical breakthroughs, we can get nicer to use mobile devices um, without having to compromise privacy. But fully realizing that potential definitely requires new research and new algorithms. An empirical evaluation of those algorithms has a really important part to play um, in, in achieving that real world impact. So here, when we're talking about empirical evaluation, we're really looking at um, evaluation that can help us identify algorithms that can have the maximum impact in the real world. Empirical studies can, of course, answer other kinds of, of interesting questions from a research perspective, but that's not what I'm going to focus on. But I don't mean to, to diminish some of those other uses of, uh, of empirical research uh, in, in the machine learning setting. One of the core challenges of evaluating FL algorithms in, um, uh, in, in, in a research setting is that most researchers, even at Google, can't easily test new algorithms on a fleet of millions of mobile devices or a network of, of data centers spread around the world. Um, so evaluating federated learning algorithms empirically usually means performing some kind of simulation. So it's important to distinguish between kind of the real world scenario that's motivating that problem, where you think this research, this new algorithm can actually have impact, and then the details of the simulation that, that you're actually going to run um, to, to kind of validate the algorithm. Both parts are important. It's important to describe the details of the simulation because that's critical to reproducibility. But then the, a really important step is to make sure that the results of those simulations can kind of 
plausibly predict how your algorithm is, is actually going to work in the real world? How does it actually solve the real world problem? So that motivates some of these um, best practices that we've kind of, um, we have not even, you know, in the papers in my group, gotten all of these things right in all of the papers we've written, I should say. This is, this is kind of based on our experience uh, over, over the past four years, developing algorithms, seeing what actually works in production, seeing what kind of research is easiest um, to take the conclusions of and, and, and make strong um, statements about what's actually going to work in real world settings. The first thing here that I think should should hopefully have been kind of made clear by the introduction that it's actually pretty important to be precise about the characteristics of the FL settings you want to apply to. Um, the big one here is kind of the cross silo versus cross device setting, but you know there's wide ranges of different settings um, you might think about, right? Are you are you studying uh, variable availability of data? Are you focusing on the heterogeneity problems that that um, we were just talking about? Um, is your algorithm stateful so it really only is applicable in the cross-device setting? Or does it work fine on random samples of anonymous devices that you never see again um, so it can be used in cross-device settings as well? Um, it's, it's important to kind of first frame things really, really clearly. And then another aspect of this, you know, if you're writing your simulation to run on a single machine in Python or, or just, you know, writing pseudocode, it can actually be easy to, to not be completely precise about what computation is happening, where and exactly what is communicated. But if, say, a DP researcher wants to pick up your optimization algorithm and understand what it would take to add a stronger privacy guarantee, it's really important that exactly what data is handled where and how it's used and, and how the data flows, um, you know, that's, that you really want to be uh, make that front and center. Uh, and of course, this is important for efficiency reasons as well, not just privacy reasons. Another thing that's really become clear as we've worked on this more is that hyperparameter tuning really matters a lot. Um, and in two senses. One, if you want to do a fair comparison of algorithms, it's really important to kind of apply the same hyperparameter tuning strategy to both of them, and it probably needs to be fairly extensive. But also, Tuning hyperparameters in, in production federated learning settings can be quite challenging. And so on the practical side of things, we have a strong preference for, for algorithms that have fewer hyperparameters or where the hyperparameters are easy to set. I've already mentioned making sure that simulations are reproducible. Another aspect when we talk about non-IID data sets, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting research you can do where you kind of construct pathologically non-IID data sets or synthetic non-IID data sets. And if what you really want to do is um, study the behavior of an algorithm in these different regimes, um, this can be a useful thing to do. But if your goal is to make the case that your algorithm will actually work well in realistic um, FL problems, a pathological non-IID partitioning isn't really going to help you make that case. Most of the way data is distributed across clients, the unbalanced IIDness is, is not really pathological. It's much more organic. Maybe closer to the IID case in some settings, maybe not. But if you demonstrate um, that your algorithm works well on, on, on a data set that's actually kind of naturally non-IID, that makes a much better case for its use in production settings. And then, of course, the metrics that are, that are, that, that are focused on matter a lot. We've, we've already talked about how communication is often a key bottleneck. So if you're comparing algorithms that all communicate the same number of bytes, bytes on each round, then kind of having rounds of communication on the x-axis is, is a really good thing to do. On the other hand, if you're looking at compression or, or different techniques that communicate different amounts per round, you actually probably want something you know, like bytes communicated on the x-axis of your, of your accuracy plots. Um, and going even farther, like if you have a very particular scenario in mind where you can quantify communication costs and computation costs, it can be really nice to actually kind of 
have a, um, uh, a, a calculation you do as part of the simulation of how long this training process would have been taken in the real world scenario. Um, on the other hand, of like the, the actual amount of wall clock time. took you to run your simulation on whatever, um, you know, data center or desktop hardware you have isn't particularly meaningful because that's pretty disconnected from, from the actual FL setting in most cases. And then, of course, kind of standard ML concerns like, like choosing the accuracy metric you evaluated on, on carefully here. We usually care about something like accuracy on held out test data as opposed to training set loss. Even if you're studying an optimization algorithm, the training set loss might be useful to look at, but to actually make the case for real world applicability, you know, we care about generalization performance and, and the loss function, the value of the loss function is usually not the most important uh, thing to look at either. Of course, on this slide, I've really kind of focused on accuracy and efficiency. There's other objectives that matter as well in federated learning, uh, privacy, robustness, fairness, the ability to personalize, and we'll touch on some of those in, in the remaining parts of this tutorial. So as kind of an example of, of some of these things, I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, recent work from my group on adaptive federated optimization algorithms. Um, so this paper introduces a new family of optimization algorithms that has some really nice uh, theory in it. There's an open source implementation of all of this in TensorFlow Federated, but I'm going to focus for this section on the, on the empirical evaluation side. One thing that's nice is that we um, didn't run on just a couple of data sets, but we ran on six different tasks across four data sets. Uh, some of these we developed in TensorFlow Federated, some of them were adapted from the LEAF um, FL benchmarks. And um, for, uh, for most of these tasks, five of the um, tasks and, and three of the data sets have exactly this kind of organic, natural, non-IID partitioning. So in the, in the federated EMNIST data set, we partition the data set based on the, the actual person that wrote the digits. Uh, for Shakespeare, we, we partition it based on the character in the play. Uh, for Stack Overflow, it's the actual person who posted the question or answer on the Stack Overflow site. So I think these are quite representative of the types of non-IID structure that will come up in, in real world problems. Um, we also did a pretty significant uh, empirical evaluation of all of these algorithms. Um, we found that momentum helps a lot and using adaptivity on the server side also helps a lot uh, kind of across the board. The other thing I want to point out here, um, it may be kind of hard to see, but the brown line is scaffold, which is a really nice algorithm with strong guarantees, but it does rely on stateful clients. So if you use it in a cross silo setting, I think you could get really good results. But here, since these are relatively large data sets, most clients participate in each round very infrequently, it actually doesn't perform uh, nearly as well as the other algorithms. And that's just an example of why being clear about the FL setting is, is really important. So before I get to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the family of algorithms um, that, uh, that this paper introduced. And basically the idea is very simple, that we can kind of take SGD on the client and replace it with an arbitrary client optimization algorithm, maybe using adaptivity, maybe just learn, learning, adjusting the learning rate. And similar on the server, we can plug in uh, what we call a server optimizer, but it's really not a, a, an optimizer. It's really just an update rule, a, a, a tool for taking a gradient or a model update and updating the model. So that allows us to do things like um, per coordinate adaptivity, like Adagrad. It allows us to introduce momentum or use more sophisticated approaches like the, like the Yogi update rule. Um, so this is what we tried out. The thing I want to emphasize here is that this actually makes it clear that even if you're doing vanilla federated averaging, there actually are kind of two learning rates that have different uh, consequences that you need to think about. One is kind of the, the learning rate you use on the client, and one is the learning rate you 
used to apply the final average update on the server. So if you think about kind of making the client learning rate very small and the server learning rate correspondingly big, you'll get something that looks much more like mini batch gradient descent because the, the model isn't moving very much on the client and you're kind of doing all your gradient computations on basically the same model. And then the server is just applying that gradient descent step. So the ratio of these two learning rates tells you something about how much adaptivity you're actually getting in the optimization process. And this can actually be quite important in the face of non-IAD data or, or heterogeneous data. But a downside of this is that it does mean that there's a larger hyperparameter uh, space that you need to search. So here we look at the, the client learning rates versus the server learning rates just for um, <clears throat> uh, on, on the Stack Overflow next word prediction task. Um, the, the left two are uh, Federated Adam and Federated Yogi, where we use the corresponding update rules on the server. And then the right-hand plot is just using momentum. Um, and the adaptive algorithms here not only achieve higher accuracy, but you can see that there's actually also a much larger regime of learning rates that, that achieve relatively good results. So you, you have a nice kind of double win here in that you're both getting better performance when you tune perfectly, but it's also easier to get to a reasonable um, space of performance. So this is basically just an example of what, what I think a, a pretty thorough empirical evaluation of, of federated optimization algorithms uh, looks like. And our hope is that by providing code for this, providing all of the hyperparameters in TensorFlow Federated, it makes it much easier for um, uh, new federated optimization research to build on these results, take these as benchmarks, and then come up with even better algorithms because there's definitely a lot more to be done in the, in the space of federated optimization. We're going to uh, kick off uh, now part three, uh, looking at privacy for federated learning and analytics. Um, the way I'd like to, to frame this is first by just thinking about privacy versus utility trade-offs. I think the perception with, with the tech industry is that we're pretty far on the utility side of this curve. I don't think that's actually um, very accurate, at least from what I've seen at Google. Um, there's a lot of both policy and technology in place that, that puts us in, I think, a pretty reasonable space here. Um, but you know, our goal as a, as a technology team and as a research team is to continue to push that Pareto frontier with better technology. So we wanna make achieving high privacy and uh, high utility uh, possible. It's still a tough question about exactly where you want to be on that trade-off frontier. That's gonna depend a lot on the application specific. So it's a question that um, we have an important role in answering as technologists, but we certainly need to hear a lot of other voices in that conversation as well. Um, but one thing we can definitely hope to do is to at least provide the best set of choices there that are possible. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that this is very much a concern. Of course, privacy isn't a scalar quantity. It's certainly not a binary quantity. It's not really even a scalar quantity, right? There's different aspects to privacy, which is part of what we're going to unpack in the first part of this, um, of, of this uh, talk. But there's also another axis here that matters a lot, which is how much computation do you have to use and how much human effort does it take to get to a particular privacy versus utility trade-off. And as anybody who's tried to get, say, differentially private model training working, it can take a lot of hyperparameter tuning. You, you might need to process a lot more data um, to pay on that front as well. So we're interested in getting those, um, in those costs down uh, as, as well. Okay, so, what, what I'd like to do is kind of propose a framework for thinking about privacy in the, in the federated learning setting, particularly in the cost device setting. And so I'm going to put back up this um, kind of cartoon visualization of the, the full uh, kind of federated learning workflow. Here we have federated training, maybe of multiple models, coordinated by a machine learning engineer kind of interacting with um, uh, the coordinating server, the selection of a final good model that is then sent out to, you know, maybe hundreds of millions of mobile devices in the deployment phase. And now we can start, start asking some questions about, about this whole system or this whole workflow. Uh, in particular, what private information might an actor learn with access to different parts of the system, um, with access to the device, with access to the kind of network transport layer, 
with, say, physical or boot access to the server, the coordinating server in the data set? Um, what if that actor could see the, the models and metrics, the aggregate uh, metrics that we're releasing to that ML engineer? Um, and then finally, what, what could you learn if you have access to that deployed model? And of course, the, the threat models across the spectrum are very, very different. Hopefully very few people have access to the device and, and almost no one should have access to say unencrypted uh, network traffic. Um, on the other hand, you know, that model that we're deploying out to use for prediction on 100 million devices, we have to assume that lots of people are gonna be able to inspect that and, um, and do various uh, analyses on it and so on. Um, so, so the scale and, and type of, of, of um, problems we have to worry about vary a lot. Uh, across this. Another version of this question is how much do I need to trust each of these parts of the system, right? Here we'd like to, to employ technologies that kind of imply trust or guarantee trust as much as possible or use algorithms that mean that again, you don't need to trust uh, various parts of the system. And in the introduction, we already talked about some of the privacy principles that federated learning in its basic setup embodies and, and, and tries to enforce. So we're minimizing data exposure by never letting the raw data leave the device. Um, the updates that are sent to the server are focused. They're intended uh, and crafted for it with a specific purpose in mind. They're aggregated as early as possible. Um, and any of those updates are anonymous and, and ephemeral. And finally, the only thing we ever release either in deployment or even to the, to the machine learning engineer are aggregate quantities that have been, been averaged or otherwise aggregated across many users. So the basic FL um, kind of uh, setup provides a lot of privacy advantages out of the box, so to speak. But it certainly, I wouldn't say that it guarantees privacy in any sense um, if, if this is all you do. I mean, guaranteeing privacy is a, is, 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 a, is a very high bar. So we need to, we have the opportunity to introduce complementary technologies um, that go even farther in addressing um, what you might learn with access to various parts of the system. Okay, so there's a number of other technologies we can introduce to provide even stronger privacy protections that build upon what kind of federated learning offers out of the box. When it comes to access to the device in the network, um, of course, encryption is kind of table stakes for any reasonable um, implementation of federated learning. And I think this is a category of approaches I'd kind of describe as how we compute. Uh, we're just gonna limit access or who can possibly access this data. So you can think of this as more of a security-based uh, approach. But here it's appropriate because somebody who just has physical access to the device or can monitor the raw bytes on the network just shouldn't be able to learn anything. We just want to completely rule that out. So encryption is a good, a good solution there. Next, we can think about what somebody could learn with physical or root access to the server. And a classic approach here coming from uh, the differential privacy literature, actually predating differential privacy, going back to Warner's randomized response in 1965, is now called local differential privacy. And the basic idea here is that each device, before it sends its update to the server, adds noise sufficient to kind of mask any private information in that update. Noise that's large enough that there's plausible deniability about any particular interpretation of that update. And if what you're doing is aggregating binary quantities over a large population, this can work pretty well. But for really high dimensional neural network models, often this ends up, to, to get a reasonable privacy guarantee, you have to add so much noise that it would just break down the training process. Um, fortunately, we have some other solutions we can potentially apply here from the how you compute perspective. The key thing to realize is that the server doesn't really need to, uh, someone with access to the server doesn't really need to be able to see any private data. So we can use something like a secure enclave, enclave a trusted execution environment, uh, to guarantee that the, all the server can do is take the encrypted per user updates compute the aggregate and release the aggregate, the, the, say the average update, but never reveal the individual user updates. Um, another way to solve that same problem is to use cryptographic techniques coming out of secure multi-party computation. Um, these actually allow you to get similar guarantees, but they're using an algorithmic or computational approach 
um, so that the server is essentially now part of a, a cryptographic protocol. Um, so you're, you're kind of adding up encrypted updates and the only thing you can possibly decrypt is the sum of those updates, but not ever get access to any individual user update. General purpose secure party multi-computation can be highly computationally expensive, enough to make it impractical for the kind of applications we have in mind. Um, but one of the things we did in this space at Google is we developed a practical secure aggregation technique specifically for sums of model updates, or of course you can then divide and use it for averages as well. Um, that scales to uh, large scale, large neural networks and also handles uh, the unreliability of devices that we need to deal with in cross device settings. Uh, I think Peter will say a little bit more about that in, in uh, the second half of this section. So now we get to the release models and, and the metrics that we give to the ML engineer coordinating this process and the final model that we deploy. And, and kind of security-based uh, or access-based approaches here aren't going to be sufficient because the ML engineer has to see some metrics to decide which models are better in order to do their job. And similarly, the deployed model needs to be usable on device. We need to make predictions from it, and we're going to show those predictions to users. That's the whole point. Um, but if you know, you're know you typing on your phone and you start typing Brenda McMahon's credit card number is, and your phone auto-completes that, obviously you have a problem, or at least I have a problem. Uh, so we want to be able to rule that kind of memorization out. And central differential privacy, where you trust the, here the server to correctly add noise and limit the sensitivity of the model to any one user's update, is the gold standard way of making those uh, kind of guarantees that the model isn't, in, isn't memorizing any one user's um, data. However, uh, those guarantees are often fairly pessimistic, they're worst case, so another um, class of complementary techniques here, you might term empirical privacy auditing. So we run a, a, a training algorithm that we think should be private. We don't think it should memorize one user's data. Maybe we have some knobs even to control uh, the degree to which it might memorize. And then we train different models and, and audit, measure how much they seem to be memorizing and ensure that we're in a safe regime before we release those models or deploy them. So with, with that overview of kind of the, the general privacy landscape of federated learning, I'm going to turn it over to Peter to dive more in depth into differentially private federated training. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. Um, there's a lot that we can talk about. This is a very rich space, so many interesting privacy technologies. But I think differential privacy is uh, one that has been studied uh, over the past uh, more than a decade, and it deserves some of our time. So let's take a look at how we can add differential privacy to federated training. But to begin with, let's look at what differential privacy really is. So differential privacy is the statistical science of trying to learn as much as possible about a group of people or devices, while learning as little as possible about any individual in it. So we want to be able to compute metrics and models on populations, but we don't want to learn specific information about any individual that is unique to that individual. So this is where it gets a little mathy, but bear with me for a second. That's how we're going to go about defining differential privacy. Say you have two adjacent databases, and we'll talk about what we mean by adjacent databases in a bit but let's say you have two adjacent databases. They're not identical, so they're different. And let's say we have the exact same query. We're trying to build a model. We're trying to train a neural network on these two adjacent data sets. Ideally, from a privacy perspective, we want the model that is computed on database C and the model that is computed on database C prime to be nearly the same. We want them to statistically have distributions that are very close to each other. This is because if data set D prime does not include a certain record or individual, then by inspecting the output of the query, which is the model computed on this data set, we wouldn't be able whether that model was computed with that record or individual or without. Now, using a bit of math, we need to try to be precise about how we're going to capture similarity between distributions over those models. So what we say is we want 
the distribution of the model being in a certain set F when it's computed on D versus when it's computed on D prime could be, you know, something exponential in epsilon multiplicatively close and delta additively close, as you see on this slide. Now, to help you better understand this, if you set both epsilon and delta to zero, so think of them as exactly equal to zero for a second, then we can show from this definition that whether I compute the model on D or D prime, I get the exact same distribution at the output. This is full privacy because you know, whether I look at M of D or M of D prime, I cannot distinguish at all between the two. They are statistically identical because they have exactly equal distribution. And then when you start relaxing the assumptions, when you grow delta to something like one, or alternatively, when you grow epsilon to infinity, then you're relaxing the constraints on how similar these two distributions are going to be. Now, in practice, there's a lot of debate on, you know, what should delta and epsilon be set to. But just as a rule of thumb, we think of delta as something that is cryptographically small or, you know, something on the order of 10 to the negative 6 or anywhere between 10 to the negative 5 and 10 to the negative 9. And the epsilons, you know, it's an even bigger debate in the community of what constitutes a good epsilon. But anywhere in the single digits or even a little higher seems to be fine. But this is, again, an open question, and we, we do not have a concrete answer to this. Now, let's get back to this question of how do we define adjacent uh, databases. One of the classical notions is called record-level adjacency, and this is one that's used by a lot of the literature on differentially private deep learning, especially in the centralized uh, settings of machine learning. And in this case, the difference between D and D prime is just one single record. So if you look at these two databases, there's identical record except for the presence or absence of a single record. And that's why this is called usually record level differential privacy. So here you're trying to protect essentially the absence or presence of that record. So you train with differential privacy and, and you get the guarantee at that level. Now, more recently, there has been a proposal to actually define adjacency as you take all the records that belong to the same user. So a user can have possibly 10 records, hundreds of records, or even thousands of records. And when you look at adjacent databases, you would basically either add or remove between, to go from D to D prime, uh, records belonging to the same user. Now, this is a harder, or if you want a stronger notion of privacy, harder to achieve in some sense, but this is more meaningful, especially in the federated learning setting, or anytime you have databases that are keyed by user IDs or authors. And this is the one that we're going to use for this talk, and this is the one that's uh, widely used for federated learning. Now, let's look at how we train models under differential privacy, especially under user-level differential privacy. And before we jump into the federated setting, let's look at how we can do it, at least in the centralized setting. So let's say you have this database E of data coming from different clients or people. The first step is to sample a batch of clients uniformly at random. Here, for instance, I'm showing that I've sampled records 4, 7, 10, and 17, 18. This is just a random sample from the database. And what we can do as a next step is to compute the gradient of the model on these sampled records and clip the L2 norm of those gradients to X. This clipping operation, it's an L2 norm projection. You're essentially projecting onto the L2 ball of radius X. You should think about it as a way to limit the contribution of each sampled user. You want to bound how much that user can move the model in a certain round. Now, next, what you do is you aggregate those clipped gradient updates and after you average them, you add Gaussian mean. It turns out that this combination of clipping 
and then after averaging, adding Gaussian noise, satisfies the pressure criteria. But this is, you know, a complex process because as you can see, applying BT is easy. One has to be careful about what type of noise they're adding. In this case, it's Gaussian. We need to be sampling from a clean Gaussian distribution with cryptographic uh, security sources, so on and so forth. So we have to be a bit careful about how we implement the mechanism. But it turns out that we have to be even more careful about how we do the privacy analysis because we're going to repeat this process a number of times every time updating the model, and we may do it thousands of times, we need a way to track how the privacy guarantees would grow with the number of rounds that we compute. So this is a complex uh, science, and uh, one way of doing it is by relying on a tool that Google has open sourced, which is called TensorFlow Privacy. It's not the only tool. You can find other tools out there. There's one that meshes well with PyTorch, and there are others, but you have to make sure that these tools are vetted and they are doing the right thing that they should be doing. And the science of accounting relies on many things, including how we sample from the database and how we add the noise. And we're going to see it, uh, a bit more about it in a bit. But let's go back to the federated study. So we saw that this is how we do federated training in general, especially for model training. We execute these rounds of computations between the server and a batch of selected clients. And the easy way to add differential privacy here to this is by clipping the updates, the model updates on the device. This is exactly the same process, process that I showed you on uh, a few slides back. So you actually do the L2 norm projection on device. And then upon aggregating the clipped updates that are incoming from the clients that have checked in and reported back, what you do is you add the Gaussian noise on the server. And you can execute a number of rounds. This is very similar to what we saw a few, like, a few slides ago. Now, this is great. In fact, you might wonder, what can we do with this? Can we learn anything? Can we train models? And it turns out on experiments that uh, we've conducted in this paper that you can actually train models with good accuracy. And these are not very small models. This is an example on, uh, basically it's a language model on a Reddit post data set. So you can see that the model is not too small. It has 1.35 million parameters. But the one thing that you should see here is that it's a large corpus of users. So one thing we would like to focus on here is you can get good accuracy and good privacy if you are willing to spend a little bit more of resources, especially on the compute communicate side. Now, let me just walk you a little bit through the results here. As you can see, if we set the clipping norm to 15 and we start increasing the noise standard deviation per round, we'll get worse performance. That's because we're getting noisier and noisier updates. And one thing I would like to show you here is that this blue line, which corresponds to a clip norm of 15 and adding noise standard deviation of 0 0.003 in a round, this can correspond to strong BP guarantees, a delta of 10 to the negative nine and an epsilon of either, you know, something like one or 4.5, but this assumes that you have a large population of users. And so it's important to know that you can come close to a baseline accuracy and you can achieve good performance, but then you may have to trade off other things, for instance, computation and communication to achieve this performance. And of course, training with differential privacy until today remains a challenging open problem in many ways. And there are a lot of interesting recent papers in this space. It's not a solved problem, but uh, we think a couple of very good steps in the right direction. And we believe that the technology is going to continue to improve and mature over the next few years. Now, one thing I assumed in the previous discussion is that the noise is going to be added on the server. So intrinsically, there's some trust that we're going to send these clipped updates to the server 
and trust that the server is going to aggregate them and add more. One way to relax this trust is to do something similar to what Brendan suggested in the first part, which is to clip and add the noise locally on the device. Now, this is perhaps great because we don't have to rely on the server in terms of adding the noise, but at the same time, there's a long line of research now that shows that if you follow this procedure, especially for high dimensional models, so for large deep models, this is going to lead to a very steep hit in the accuracy. So it's almost impossible to train models with good accuracy and good privacy under this version of differential privacy, which is known as the local model of differential privacy. So this actually leads to the fundamental question, which is basically central DP seems to have this very nice property of we can get reasonable or high utility with good privacy, but in terms of local DP, we like that we will need much weaker trust assumptions. And so how can we actually get the best of both worlds? And this is really what leads to this notion of distributed differential privacy. Now, when we say distributed differential privacy, what we really mean is distributed trust models of differential privacy. So what we are really decentralizing here is where we place the trust in the system. And I'll show you three flavors of distributed differential privacy, just to give you a bit of uh, information about how we can do so. The easiest one is to say, the users are going to clip and add noise to their updates. And then what they will do is they will send their updates to a trusted third party. Think of this trusted third party as perhaps a separate company that has no interest in your data maybe, or maybe a separate team in the same company that doesn't really interact with the team that is running the server. And what this third party can do is it could strip off any identifiers, all the metadata, so authorship information, and it could shuffle everything around and forward the shuffled noise and code gradients to the server. And then the server could take these gradients, it wouldn't know who sent what, and it would basically use that to compute the sum or the model update. Now we can show that under this uh, model, we get amplification in the privacy guarantee, simply because we have anonymized the authorships of the gradients, we've kind of separated this out, we get a boost in the privacy guarantee. And this, is, this has been uh, this, kind of the focus in differential privacy over the past few years of understanding precisely how much boost we get in privacy under this type of model. But this again requires that there is a trusted third party, which is not always there. Another one that Brendan also mentioned uh, in the earlier part of this talk uh, is what if we use trusted computing or trusted execution environments? Here, what we can do is we can, using secure enclaves, attest that the gradients that are sent from the devices are being clipped, noised, and aggregated before that aggregate can be decrypted. So everything is done in a trusted computing kind of secure enclave. And um, even if you somehow have access to the raw data that going, uh, sorry, inside, inside the enclave. Uh, there are kind of cryptographic or secure measures to to ensure that you would not know exactly uh, the data. All right, so the third one is 
achieving trust via cryptography. Um, and here, Uh, using multi-party computation protocols uh, such something like secure aggregation that Brendan also touched on, we can updates from the server and only allow the server to see aggregates. So you can see that two and three are uh, kind of similar flavors and closely related to each other. So I'm, in the remainder of this uh, part, I'm going to focus on this third actor, which is achieving trust via cryptography. And I'm going to zoom in and talk about secure aggregation. So secure aggregation is a multi-party computation protocol. It's an interactive crypto cryptographic protocol where the users engage with a server in order to exchange kind of uh, secret shares that each client can add to their data. And when they add to their data, if you look at that update, which is the true data plus those secret shares that have been added, it would not be at all, you know, it would not make any sense it would essentially not leak any information because it's kind of cryptographically secure. But when you add all those messages, the secret shares are designed in a way such that they cancel each other. And when they cancel each other, you get exactly the right summation that you're looking for. So this is called secret sharing. And the protocol that our team has designed um, is, you know, based on secret sharing, but it also includes a lot of uh, additional ways to make sure that this is robust to drop out because clients can disappear. As we saw some of the challenges of federate learning, some people can start the computation but never uh, reappear. And it could be also robust to malicious clients and it's scalable to very high dimensional vectors. Now, it's hard to dive into the details of uh, secure aggregation, but uh, at least in the first protocol that we designed, uh, there, we showed that you get reasonable expansion in the communication budget for, for models with anywhere between 1 million and 16 million parameters and populations of 1 to 10,000. And in fact, in a more recent work, we looked at ways to leverage the randomness and how clients really interact together instead of having to share secrets and secret shares between every pair of two individual clients, you can reduce that drastically and achieve, if you want, much better performance on the computation and communication aspect. So this is really a table that compares the new algorithm, which got published in CCS 2020, to the original algorithm, which was published in CCS 2017. And the one main thing that you know 
this is that this quadratic dependency on the number of points in the rounds is reduced to something kind of logarithmic. So something on the order of n log n. And that's a big win because for the same resources, for the same computation, and communication resources, now we can suddenly support much larger batches. So we can go anywhere you know, from a thousand to tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands under this new protocol without having to really sacrifice the security guarantees of the multi-party computation protocol. So I encourage you to take a look at the paper. It has a lot more details that are very interesting. Now, putting this all together, what we can do is we can create a flavor of distributed descent to privacy via secure aggregation. And in this setting, users would clip their updates and add a little bit of noise on their device, perhaps to achieve some local descent to privacy, even though that's not really the main target here. but it gives you some layer of protection in case secure aggregation was totally broken, but that's not really the objective. But the whole point is that once everything is securely summed up, the server would see the model update, the true model update, plus the right amount of noise that would have otherwise been added in the central uh, DP. And so now you get a certain central guarantee here. All right, so this is everything I wanted to say on this uh, distributed DP front. And the last bit of this uh, tutorial, uh, or this part of the tutorial, I want to focus on you know, how can we achieve precise DP DP guarantees for real world uh, cross device federated learning. Now, if you remember when I was talking about descent to privacy, I said that we need to sample uniformly from the database. And then we do the clipping and noise addition. And that's how we can calculate the epsilon and delta that we get in every round of the algorithm. And we can account and budget to compute the epsilon and delta at the end of the algorithm after running for a number of rounds. The problem here is that in federated learning, especially cross-device federated learning, usually we, there is no notion of a fixed or known database or a size of a population that the server actually knows a priori. In fact, it's even more challenging because the system is very dynamic. Users can be offline sometimes, but then they can be online. They can start the computation, but never, uh, report back, they can drop out, so on and so forth. So this introduces a big challenge on the differential privacy app. If we want to compute a precise epsilon and delta. So for privacy, purposes, what we would like to do is we would like to have kind of a protocol or an algorithm that is robust to nature's choice in terms of climate. Dropout or availability, and that could 
give us good privacy act and, and utility trade-offs, possibly at the expense of maybe having to run the process a little longer or use more resources, something like that. But we want to be able to have these algorithms lead to good ways to do accounting, to give very precise and sharp upper bounds on the epsilons and deltas. That we get, and we got, we want these algorithms to also preserve Um, the, the accuracy of the computation. Now, what this this leads to is we kind of are looking for things where uh, we shift all the randomness and coordination a little away from the server to the client so that the client would start deciding when to participate or how to participate. So thinking a little bit more on this front, We can think of this is just one way of presenting things a protocol schema for DP in the cost of life that we can learn. This is at a very high level what. We kind of want. So nature, you know, there, there is a set of population. This is C population here. This is not known to the server, and it could be dynamically even varying with time. But in every step of the protocol, nature chooses a subset. This is C available. Those are the clients that are available. And each client would run a local, if you want, uh, computation to decide whether or not it's going to check in. And this computation could be a function of time or other variables that we can, uh, or, or states that we can feed to it. Now, this would give us the set of devices that are able to check in. And from those devices, the server would select a subset, depending on how much bandwidth it has, so on and so forth. And then because some can drop out, go offline for whatever reason, the set of reported clients is going to be smaller than the one that was selected by the server to be explored. And so then what the server sees at the end of the day is the local update states that were computed on the set of reports with clients and those The process a little longer or use more resources, something like that. But we want to be able to have these algorithms lead to good ways to do accounting, to give very precise and sharp upper bounds on the epsilons and deltas that we get, 
we got we want these algorithms to also preserve the um, the, the accuracy of the computation. Now, what this leads to is we kind of are looking for things where uh, we shift all the randomness and coordination a little away from the server to the client so that the client would start deciding when to participate or how to participate. So thinking a little bit more on this front, we can think of, this is just one way of presenting things, a protocol schema for DP in the cost of life stuttering of learning. This is at a very high level what we kind of want. So nature, you know, there, there is a set of population. This is C population here. This is not known to the servers. And it could be dynamically even varying with time. But in every step of the protocol, nature chooses a subset. This is C available. Those are the clients that are available. And each client would run a local, if you want, uh, computation to decide whether or not it's going to check in. And this computation could be a function of time or other variables that we can, uh, or, or states that we can feed to it. Now, this would give us the set of devices that are able to check in. And from those devices, the server would select a subset, depending on how much bandwidth it has, so on and so forth. And then because some can drop out, go offline for whatever reason, the set of reported clients is going to be smaller than the one that was selected by the server to report. And so then what the server sees at the end of the day is the local updates that were computed on the set of reported clients. And those local updates would take the model that was broadcasted to them and perhaps add noise or do a variety of things that are available to them. And this is where what we want is when we aggregate these local updates on the server, we want XT, which is the aggregate, to allow us to be able to show precise DP guarantees. We want to be able to release the trace of XT over the protocol step and be able to say that if an external adversary sees the trace of XT, we can give the following precise bound on epsilon beta. Now, one attempt in this direction that uh, we, our group uh, recently, in collaboration with people from Brain Privacy and other parts of the company, has done is called privacy amplification via random checking. Um, in the interest of time, I just, I'm just going to touch on the high-level idea here, which is clients would, when they are available, flip a coin and decide whether or not they want to participate. And if they choose to participate, they would choose in what round they want to participate. So they're randomizing their choice of participation, and if they choose to participate, where and when they participate, in which training round. And it turns out that if you take this and you do the math behind it, you can get the same rate that you see in the simple setting where we do uniform sampling from a fixed database. Now, this is still an open area of research and an emerging area of research, so we encourage people to think about these system challenges, how they impact differential privacy. But in the interest of time, I will conclude this part of the tutorial. Thank you. All right, welcome to part four of our tutorial. In this part, we're going to discuss emerging open problems and other topics. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, open problems. One is in the space of improving efficiency and effectiveness. Questions like how can we reduce wall clock time training or personalize the, uh, you know, for each device, uh, support machine learning workflows like debugging, hyperparameter searches, doing uh, reinforcement learning, unsupervised learning, so on and so forth. These are all very important questions. Um, another one is addressing uh, sources of bias, ensuring fairness. It could be bias in the training data or in the distribution, bias in device availability, uh, and, and others. Robustness is one big topic uh, as well. You know, compromised devices or training uh, on device, um, so on and so forth. You can read a lot about these uh, interesting open problems and advances in open problems in federated learning. It's on archive. But for this part of the tutorial, we're going to focus on three modules. The first one is robustness against failures and attacks. 
The second one is modeling heterogeneous data for fairness and personalization. And the last one is system challenges. So let's start with robustness against failures in a test. And let's start with failures before we move on to a test. So remember, this is how federated training proceeds between train evaluate on decentralized data. And if everything works like we want it to, we would see something like this. As the number of communication rounds increases, we see that the accuracy is increasing and all the metrics are looking great. But sometimes we could, you know, due to some bug somewhere, we may not see a good steady increase in the accuracy. We might see somehow the loss shooting up suddenly or the accuracy is dropping down. It may never happen or it at one point may all break apart. And these happen all the time, not just in federated learning, it happens in classical machine learning. So this is all to say that machine learning in general and federated learning in specific, they require data inspection because you, know, you may want to do something like predicate checking of the data, you want to debug mistakes, or you know, why is there poor performance on certain classes or slices of the users or the data? Maybe human labeling was bad or poor in some cases. Maybe there's bias in the training data, imbalances, so on and so forth. And for all these you know, types of tasks that a machine learning modeler may want to do, usually they involve a form of data inspection by either grabbing random training examples or those on which you know, we have a misclassification event, so on and so forth, as you see in this paper. Now, in machine learning, if everything is centralized, this may be accessible to the engineer. But in federated learning, the whole premise is that we're never going to collect raw training examples. Remember, we said we only take focused minimal updates. And so it defeats the whole story of federated learning in some sense to ask users to send us uh, some specific examples from their uh, local source. And so there's a real tension here between how do we make sure that these bugs are addressed and how do we make sure that the privacy of the users is protected. And you know, in the interest of time, I just give you one example of such uh, cases and how we might go about doing it in the federated setting. Look at this example. Let's say we're trying to tra train uh, a classifier. This is the EMNIST uh, data set. So you have digits and characters and uh, some of the examples on some of the devices have inverted backgrounds or inverted pixels in some sense. So instead of seeing white digits or characters on black backgrounds, you see black digits and characters on white backgrounds. And as you can see, without this bug, we, you know, the performance across the users is around, I don't know, 90 plus percent. But when in the presence of this bug, you see that for about half of the users, the model is going to fail miserably. Now, one way of addressing this issue in the federated setting is to train two generative models, in this case, two GANs, generative adversarial networks, one on the subset of the data that, are, uh, that is exhibiting high classification accuracy, and another on the subset of the data that's exhibiting low classification accuracy. And I have to emphasize here that when we train these two models, we train them with differential privacy to make sure that we cannot reconstruct the data of any particular user. We want to make sure that we're preserving privacy. And in fact, if you do this, you will see that after, say, about a thousand rounds, if we try to use these generative models that were trained and we, we, we look at what they have learned to create, you will see that on the slice of Of users where uh, data classification was low, the accuracy was low, we see that it's kind of generating images of black digits or characters on white backgrounds. And then on devices where the classification accuracy was high, it's generating white digits on black backgrounds. So this hopefully gives the engineer an idea that there is something wrong here. There was a bug somewhere. And they could potentially, in a, in a fix, address this issue. 
Now, one thing I'd like to focus on again is the use of differential privacy. And the other thing is that notice that we don't really need very high quality for these generative models. The point isn't to generate very real looking data, but rather it's to just give us a population level view of what's going on so that we can figure out where the bug is and figure out how to address it. If you want to read more about this, it's in uh, a paper called Generative Models for Effective ML on Private Decentralized Data. Now, next, I would like to move on to robustness against attack. And I will start with data poisoning attacks. These are attacks where the adversary corrupts training data that is used during the on-device training. And the second flavor of attack are called model poisoning attacks. And here, as opposed to corrupting the training data, what you would do is you would actually break into the training binary and change the way the model is being trained. So you would actually have control over the optimization algorithm that's being used locally to update the model. Now, if we compare these two to each other, the first one, which is data poisoning, requires that the adversary inject poison data into compromised clients. And therefore, compromising clients is less expensive, perhaps still expensive, but less expensive compared to model poisoning. And the impact is probably limited because we cannot change the training binary or, uh, uh, you know, kind of poison the uh, model update. On the other hand, for model poisoning, this requires that the adversary break into the client's training binary. And compromising, compromising clients here is more expensive because you have to break through all the security layers and attestation that uh, the app and perhaps the, uh, the, the, the operating system, uh, they have in place to be able to make, uh, to conduct this attack. That's why it's actually way more expensive to be conducted. But if it happens, it can, in some cases, have kind of detrimental effects because you can start sending uh, poisoned updates that can be bad for the algorithm. Now, this is at a high level how we break these attacks during training time, model poisoning, data poisoning. We can break them in a different way, which is targeted versus untargeted. Under untargeted attacks, the adversary wants the performance of the model to degrade on the main path. Essentially, I just want to break the model. I want it to not perform well. In the targeted case, which is also commonly referred to as backdoor, what I have is essentially a very precise path on which I want the model to underperform. And I want it to continue to have good accuracy on the main path. Here's an example from a recent paper. You can, for instance, look at just cars with racing uh, stripes or green painted cars or vertical stripes on background walls. And you may want to, for each one of these three tasks, say, I just want the classifier on these specific uh, tasks to fail. But on any other task, perhaps on any label or, or whatnot, I want the model to continue to perform well. These are called semantic attacks. And, and these are you know, a subset of targeted attacks. Now, in a recent work, we have uh, our team has looked at you know, how easy it is to backdoor federated learning. We focused on targeted attacks, the ones that I was just describing, and we looked at model poisoning, which is the strong version of attacks where you can send uh, arbitrary model updates back to the server. And the paper is on archive. We have uh, the code open source on GitHub for people to, to use and build on. I wanted to show you quickly on, you know, a small EMS data set, uh, our experiment, we chose 20 random users and we changed their sevens to ones. That's essentially the uh, backdoor attack. We wanted to make sure that the model that, you know, it works well on most of the digits or all of the digits, except for the sevens of those 20 clients. That's how we form the specific targeted task that we want to backdoor. And um, you can see that we had one attacker in every round 30 clients per round. And the main takeaway here from the slide is that doing a simple combination of bounding the norm of the update and adding a little bit of noise takes us a long way. We can see that the performance on the main task is not at all impacted under all these defenses, whereas the performance on the backdoor attack is significantly reduced when we do a combination of bounding the norm and adding a teeny tiny bit of noise. 
Now, this may remind you of differential privacy. The point here is not to achieve differential privacy. So we're not computing epsilons and deltas or reporting them. We're just uh, using the fact that this way of training models prevents it from uh, overfitting to any particular individual. Now, this is a very uh, rich area of research. So we encourage people to look at it. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, shortly after our paper came another paper, uh, mostly that tries to do attack again for these uh, kind of uh, tail tasks, not the heavy or the head tasks. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of tension between robustness and privacy because, and, and also fairness. So there's a rich intersection and tension between the different criteria that we may want uh, to, to, to look at. Um, we think that there is a call to action here. We need more benchmarking problems. Uh, we urge people, uh, researchers, to look at more realistic scenarios and realistic uh, uh, poisoning rates. So I will leave it here, but um, this is all to say that there's a lot of interesting work that's happening, and we, we hope that people will continue to look at it. With that, I'll uh, hand it uh, off to Virginia. Thanks, Peter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about modeling heterogeneous federated data. In some sense, this is a very fundamental question in, in federated learning, right? So before we actually perform the training and before we think about adding privacy on top of that training, there's a question of how should we actually model the data? So what's the model that we're using, uh, you know, that we're performing training on? And uh, this is also the uh, kind of recent and ongoing uh, area of work. And, and part of the reason is that uh, these, these two problems I'll talk about today, fairness and personalization, are on their own receiving a lot of attention for uh, kind of other domains. So there's a lot of, um, you know, work going on, uh, you know, separate from federated learning uh, on these problems. But I think that federated learning is really an interesting and motivating application for both of these issues of, of fairness and personalization. Um, so I'm going to start by, by talking about fairness and, and how fairness can come into play in federated learning. And then I'll talk about some high level techniques for personalizing federated models. So first, let's kind of just go back and recall the objective that we proposed looking at uh, back in part two when we were talking about federated optimization. Uh, so we talked about trying to estimate the sort of true underlying uh, risk of the, uh, you know, the data and the, the population of devices and on each of those devices, the uh, you know, population of data that's generated on those devices. Uh, and we talked about estimating this, this true expected risk uh, via this empirical risk uh, objective. So one thing to be aware of uh, when thinking about kind of solving these, you know, very popular um, empirical risk minimization objectives is that at a high level, what you're trying to do often is to, to minimize an average of the losses across the devices. Um, and this is a very intuitive thing to do. You know, we, we're minimizing the expected performance. Um, but one thing to, to be cautious about is that, you know, if you're just looking at the average performance, um, there are no, you know, accuracy guarantees for individual devices or clients in the network. Um, and in particular, if you kind of focus just on this, you know, expected performance, um, you might do well on average, but while having the performance very widely uh, across the network. And this is just kind of one example of that. Um, this is for Sent140. So this is a, an example data set from the LEAF benchmark. And what you see is that if you look at the, the test accuracy, uh, the distribution of, of test accuracy across devices, if you, you know, solve a kind of just an ERM objective uh, for this problem, um, what you can see is that on average you do quite well, um, but for a subset of the, the devices, the performance can, could be quite poor. Um, and so there's a, a natural question here uh, in thinking about fairness. Um, so, you know, obviously we want to do well on average, uh, but there's also a question of, you know, if we can encourage a more fair or uniform uh, quality of service across the network and uh, a more fair distribution of the model performance across the devices or clients. And this is something that we, we've looked at in recent work. Um, and uh, the reason I'm presenting this objective in particular is that it's, it's fairly general and it encompasses um, prior work both in fair federated learning and just in, in fairness and machine learning. 
Um, but kind of when we were thinking about this objective, uh, the objective that I'm, I'm presenting here is an alternative to empirical risk minimization. Um, and it's inspired by this idea of, of fair resource allocation in wireless sensor networks. So in that community, uh, there's a notion called alpha fairness, uh, where you want to uh, ensure that across the network you have some resource like bandwidth that's fairly allocated uh, across the nodes. Um, and, and the intuition and the analogy for applying that objective to kind of the ERM setup uh, is that, you know, the, the resource that we're thinking about in, in training these objectives is the loss, right? The larger the loss, the more you will, you know, spend in the training procedure um, trying to optimize that loss, right? And so what we can do intuitively is, is take the losses and raise them to this exponent Q. And uh, what the effect is, is that as, uh, as Q becomes larger, what we'll be doing is forcing the, the model to really focus on the worst performing loss, in this case, the worst performing device. And if you go to the extreme where Q is equal to infinity here, you get back a notion of min-max fairness where you want to minimize the worst performing loss across all of the devices. Uh, and this, this has been explored both in the, the fairness literature, this is commonly referred to as representation disparity. Um, so we're ensuring that there's no disparity uh, across the, uh, here the representation is in terms of the devices. Um, and this has also been explored in the federated learning literature uh, through a method called agnostic federated learning. But the nice thing about uh, thinking about it in terms of this uh, kind of general framework is that you can think about tuning this parameter Q depending on you know, how you want to trade off the idea of kind of the, the average accuracy versus this, this notion of uh, representation fairness. Okay, <clears throat> um, and you know, just going back to this previous example, kind of the, the key idea for why this can be beneficial is you can, you can still do very well on average, but you're avoiding this, this uh, you know, these concerning quality of service uh, situations where you're doing quite poor on some of the devices. And in looking at this across kind of a suite of, of federated data sets, so these data sets are, are from the LEAF benchmark, uh, what we can see is that, you know, while still doing well, exactly as well on average, we can actually cut the variance of the test accuracy distribution in half. Um, and so what we're able to do is, you know, in terms of that kind of ERM objective, if what we care about is the average accuracy, we can do just as well, but while reducing the, the variability and helping to promote fairness. Okay, and this is kind of just one uh, potential way to, to think about fairness in the federated setting, but I think this is a really interesting and ongoing uh, area of work. And uh, as, as Peter mentioned, it's really interesting to think about fairness in particular and how it composes with other sorts of constraints in the federated setting. So not just accuracy, but also things like privacy and, and robustness, uh, which may have an effect on fairness as well. Now I want to uh, kind of go back to this this slide on the uh, ERM objective for federated learning and point out one very important assumption that we are making here, um, which is that we're seeing a sample of, of devices. Uh, and in addition, those devices may themselves be generating data according to their own distribution, um, right? And so this is the kind of idea we've been talking about a lot that the data itself might be um, heterogeneous and variable, and that can affect the optimization procedure. It can affect the fairness of the model that's trained. Um, but even more fundamentally, it can also affect, you know, whether we actually want to train just a single model for all of the devices in the network, or whether we want to consider potentially learning separate or personalized models for those devices. Uh, and so kind of thinking more generally here, you know, the, the higher level question is how should we really be modeling this this federated data. Uh, you know, on one extreme, you can imagine learning just a separate model for each of the devices. The obvious downside here is that some of these devices might not have much data. And so this is super personalized, but it, it doesn't really allow you to learn from your peers in the network or, or from similar devices. Uh, on the other extreme, kind of the, the de facto that we've been talking about is that you're learning just a single model. So one global model kind of for all of the, the devices or clients in the network. Uh, and this certainly enables a lot of learning, but the issue is that uh, if you use this kind of just as is, um, there's not necessarily any form of personalization here that's happening for the, de the devices. And so kind of, you know, what we might hope for is something in between. You know, we'd like to, to learn from our peers in the network, but we'd like to do so in a smart way. 
uh, where we still are able to kind of take that shared model, but also personalize it uh, to heterogeneous data on the devices. Okay, and in terms of thinking about approaches for personalization, uh, again, I just want to mention that this, uh, each of these areas <laughs> is quite broad. There's a lot of really exciting ongoing work in, in the areas of multitask learning and fine tuning and, and meta learning. But I wanted to mention these as, as some high level approaches that uh, can be quite useful for thinking about personalization for federated learning. So uh, the, the first approach here, multitask learning, the high level idea is that uh, at the same time that you're learning kind of these, these independent models, these personalized models, um, you're also learning kind of the shared structure that exists between those models. So you're jointly learning all of these personal, personalized models at once. Uh, alternatively, you can think about doing something uh, kind of as a, in a post-processing way. So uh, you can think instead about kind of maybe learning a global model just as we've been talking about, say, you know, using federated averaging, uh, but then deploying that model and fine tuning or adapting it on local data. And I wanted to mention that there's a lot of um, you know, conflicting terminology out there. Uh, this is also sometimes referred to as, as transfer learning. And you can also think about you know, going from one source to a target where that, ta that target really differs in terms of the domain as being a domain adaptation problem. Um, transfer learning also sometimes more broadly refers to all of these problems. So you're, you know, you're <laughs> transferring knowledge between tasks. Um, but one particularly exciting uh, area within kind of fine tuning and transfer learning is the, the problem of meta learning. Um, and that's another one that I'll mention because it actually has some very close, close ties to, to federated learning. And kind of one distinction between just, you know, maybe learning this kind of black box global model and then fine tuning it is that in meta learning, the idea is, you, you know, you are, are thinking about learning some, producing some initialization as your final product, where that initialization is learned over, over multiple tasks. So you're learning to learn this, this good initialization um, that you can then fine tune. Okay, so I'm just gonna say a little bit more about each of these areas. Uh, so first, with regards to multitask learning, the kind of the key idea here is that we're thinking about a task as being a device. So you can think about each device as generating its own data and, and we're thinking about that as a separate task. Uh, in multitask learning, broadly, the goal is, is to improve generalization um, by taking the, the training signals of related tasks and using them as a form of in inductive bias. So we're jointly learning between these uh, related tasks or related devices. Uh, and just to kind of you know, make this more concrete, uh, if we go back to kind of our, our previous ERM objective, the way that you can think about this is that uh, now, instead of having a single global model, we have one separate model for each task or device. Uh, and then what we, can, what we can do is we can think about learning not only those separate models, but also some shared structure between those models. So for example, in this kind of general multitask learning setup, you can imagine that this task relationship omega could be learning things like uh, you know, all of the tasks or devices being related and you're just learning the weights on the edges in this graph you might learn that there are outliers that exist in the network that clusters or groups form, or maybe that there's some asymmetrical relationship. So for example, a power user uh, exists uh, within the network. Okay, and, and the, the form of this objective takes uh, kind of common forms that you, you may be used to seeing. Um, I'll highlight the one on the left in particular, this, this mean regularized objective. Um, so this is commonly, you know, kind of the, the intuition here is that you learn not only uh, the separate models, but you also ensure that those models don't deviate too much from the average model. So this is a very simple form of, of multitask learning where you're, you're both kind of learning the independent models, but you're somehow enforcing some strict shared structure between those models. Okay, and this is, this is something that we looked at in previous work, so, uh, you know, in this this work um, from NeurIPS in 2017, we kind of first uh, explored this idea of personalization for federated learning through this uh, multitask learning framework. Um, and we specifically developed, uh, based on the uh, COCO method that I talked about in the optimization uh, section, a, a dual-based uh, solver, uh, which allows you to decompose the objective uh, more easily across the network. Uh, but moving forward, I think, you know, to really make this uh, scalable and, and applicable to, uh, to federated learning, it's important to think about how to uh, 
uh, solve this problem, you know, in, in the primal and how to, to make this a little bit more scalable. So I think that this is a really uh, a promising direction. Uh, and along those lines, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about the, the problem of, of scalability, uh, a really promising approach here is, is also the problem uh, is, is the solution of fine tuning or specifically meta learning. And I wanted to bring up just, just one slide um, kind of showing how related these, these two areas are. Uh, so again, there's a ton of work going on in, in meta learning that's very exciting. There's also a lot of work going on in federated learning. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think this, this connection was kind of first made uh, last year at NeurIPS, and, and I, I just grabbed a, a screenshot from um, this paper, uh, which was proposed later, and then looking at uh, specifically um, mammal and, and reptile and how they compare to federated averaging. And what's quite interesting is if you can, you know, if you look at kind of the play-by-play -play here of, of reptile, which is a popular method for meta-learning and federated averaging, um, and you think about kind of in the, the meta-learning scenario, you know, we're talking about tasks. Uh, in the federated setting, we're talking about clients. Uh, but beyond that kind of uh, simple modification, you can see that these methods are in fact doing something quite similar. Uh, so in reptile, you're thinking about sampling clients and performing the, these local updates on, on the clients. In federated learning, you're thinking about sampling, uh, sorry, <laughs> so you're thinking about sampling tasks. In federated learning, you're thinking about sampling clients. Um, but in fact, at a, at a high level, the, uh, the updates here are, are, are quite similar. Um, and I think this is really important both to think about meta-learning as being an effective tool for personalization and federated learning, but also for the, the work that's being done in federated learning translating to other domains as well. So kind of translating also to, to problems in, in meta-learning and uh, multitask learning and transfer learning. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll pass things over to Brendan. All right, um, for the last section of this part, I'm gonna talk uh, just briefly about some of the systems challenges that come up in federated learning. And I think even if you're not a systems researcher or a systems engineer building a production distributed FL setting, it's really useful to have some of these challenges in the back of your mind when you're tackling problems like fairness or personalization, uh, optimization, because it'll, the, the consideration of these practical constraints comes up on the algorithmic side as well. Some of the algorithms are make themselves much easier to implement in ways that um, are compatible with the system challenges that also need to be addressed. And so I'll start by, by looking at, at um, the cross uh, device setting again. And most of the challenges here kind of fall directly out of some of the characteristics we talked about back in the, uh, in the introduction. So we're kind of coming full circle here, right? Um, the fact that, that you potentially have a, a massively parallel setting, right? You have, you know, hundreds of millions or a billion or more clients uh, that potentially all want to be talking to this server. Unless you can rate limit or control the, those connections appropriately, um, your, your server is going to go down. Uh, so there's a basic kind of traffic shaping um, aspect to this. Another aspect, though, is that those devices are also um, often unavailable and unreliable. You can't, uh, you, you're, you're stuck with randomly sampling them. That has big algorithmic uh, consequences, which we've already talked about, but it also has systems um, implications in terms of how you select devices whether, you know, do you, how do you handle devices that drop out of the, of the computation and so on. And that's, that's really getting at this, this high unreliability. Um, you know, we see 5%, 15% dropout rates uh, pretty typically for production cross-device FL applications. So you need to worry about, um, you know, how, how is your system going to deal with that? First, you need to make sure that the system just doesn't fall over. Uh, that it still makes progress even if um, devices are dropping out. There's some simple things you can do that actually work pretty well, like you can ask more clients for updates than you think you really need, and then kind of just take the first or take a fixed number of updates that come in so that if some devices drop out, you still get the right number of updates. But this then co connects uh, quite directly to some of the questions around bias and fairness um, you need to worry about are those devices that are dropping out coming from a 
you know, they have a different data distribution that's going to end up underrepresented. And finally, there's a big set of kind of just operational challenges that come up if you actually try to do this um, at a massive scale. Uh, so you have to worry about ensuring compatibility of the code you're deploying uh, to mobile devices with multiple versions of that deployed runtime. Not everybody updates the apps on their phone um, equally frequently. Uh, you have to ensure stability of user devices in all circumstances. So we really want to avoid any impact on performance, battery, um, meter network usage, and so on. And then also to make this easy to use for, for multiple kind of apps or, or multiple teams that want to be doing federated learning, you probably need to be running a multi-tenant uh, service um, used by a whole bunch of people, and that brings a bunch of system challenges. And then another big part of it is, um, actually, I'll, I'll come back to the, to the workflows part of it. This is just an example of a cross-device federated learning protocol from uh, the paper we put out in 2019 towards federated learning at scale. So if you're interested in the, um, the systems aspects, this is um, the reference I would recommend starting with. I'm putting this protocol up here mostly just to indicate that once you take all of those systems constraints into account, you necessarily end up with a, with a fairly complicated protocol that you have to implement in your distributed system. And this actually connects back really nicely to, to some of the things I was saying about TensorFlow Federated. TensorFlow Federated was designed with these kind of production constraints in mind. In particular, the idea of having a declarative uh, specification of the federated computation means we can then kind of compile that, comp that computation down to run on a, a wide range of um, kind of deployment environments. In particular, since algorithms are specified kind of generically in terms of a, a federated mean or federated sum operator, that can then be decomposed and the implementation of that might actually be, you know, a multi-tier aggregation where you do some aggregation at the leaves and then you pass those up to other aggregators and so on, um, which allows you to get a lot of scalability. Uh, but the point is that by specifying computations in this way, uh, we have a lot of flexibility to provide uh, efficient runtimes that work in a bunch of different scenarios. Um, the other thing, of course, that's important here is making sure that those local computations can be packaged up and shipped to device. So you also um, are set up to handle some of the uh, runtime compatibility issues I was mentioning. And then developer workflows are a really big part of this, right? If you actually have a lot of ML engineers trying to be uh, productive in this setting, you have to answer a bunch of questions or provide a bunch of um, functionality in addition to just training a single model. You need to be able to train a lot of models. You need to be able to um, get metrics from those models, compare them, do hyperparameter searches. And then when a model isn't converging or breaking, you need access to enough metrics or debugging tools to figure out what's going on. This gets at uh, some of what Peter was talking about earlier in this, in this section. And finally, I wanted to zoom in just uh, a little bit on one specific issue, which is the variability in population scales and availability patterns. So devices typically meet the eligibility requirements being idle and plugged in and on free Wi-Fi at night. Uh, when, when they're charging on a bedside table or something. And so if you're training, say, an English language model, especially, say, a U.S. English language next word prediction model, you're going to see, you know, very spiky availability. And that's something that, that you need to take into account both algorithmically um, but also from a systems perspective. If you're just selecting clients at a constant rate, you're either going to be getting far too many or far too few devices. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that it's actually also really important to be able to handle really small populations, right? Like you might have just a team of developers that want to be testing things out on a production infrastructure and, you know, there's tens of them. And so there you actually need to coordinate phones to, to, to get them to show up at the same time so that they can actually make progress and complete a round with a sufficient number of updates. Whereas if you have really huge populations, you have the inverse problem. You want to be turning most of the devices away and making sure your server isn't overwhelmed. So scaling down is a big problem as well as scaling.
a lot of those considerations are specific to kind of the cross device setting. That is a lot of things get easier if you're talking about a cross silo setting where the clients are, are running in a data center, right? You have higher reliability, most clients can participate in all rounds, you have faster compute and network all around. Um, but there are some other kind of systems challenges that are specific uh, potentially to the cross silo federated learning setting. We talked about a bunch of the types of heterogeneity that come up in the uh, um, in the cross device setting, but one thing that does tend to be homogenous is you're doing federated learning across you know users of a specific app. So you know at least they're running the same app, they're storing their training data in the same format. Uh, and so you can use the same assume that the same features and the same labels exist on all of the devices. If you're doing cross silo learning across uh, say A set of 10 different hospitals, um, all with their different electronic medical records formats and so on, you have some, some significant kind of um, database alignment problems that you probably need to solve before you do uh, and before you can train anything. Um, similarly, if, if you have different parts of a user's data spread across multiple silos, multiple institutions, you have to deal with joins. And then there's also just a different set of software deployment challenges there, uh, which are likely more complex than, than a a simple setting where, where each client is just running the same the same app. So there's lots more we could go into on the um, on the system challenges side of things, but this just gives you a flavor uh, of, of some of the things that come up when you do this uh, when you when you when you're making federated learning work in practice. And I think with that, we'll end the tutorial. There's going to be a, a few different ways you can get questions to us, so um, tune in to the uh, the tutorial homepage. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to interacting. Thanks. Okay, so with that final session on federated learning, we come to a completion of this GNX New Rips conference. It was a lovely time having all of you guys. And we on the behalf, I, Somdev Basu, and on behalf of the entire GNX team, would like to congratulate you on completing the Twitter career path. Thank you for the entire streaming. This is GNX New Rips 20 conference being hosted for the